on Thursday, January or June 21st, 2018 at our offices on Federal Street. First item is always the minutes. Commissioner uh, sure, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when the agenda was posted, we thought we'd have the uh, meeting minutes ready, but as you can see from looking through the packet, uh, we are still working on those June 7th uh, meeting minutes. We'll have them at the, the next commission meeting. At our, next, at our next commission meeting, which will be in Plainville on Tuesday at uh, 5.30, I think, where we're both going to have a Plainville report um, from Plain Ridge Park Casino as well as a, a presentation of the research data that uh, we've collected now. We've had two full years, about, we've had three full years of the operation of Plain Ridge Park Casino, and we've done very, very extensive research on the social and economic impacts of that casino on Plainville and its surrounding communities in the first two years. And uh, we decided it would be a good idea to go back to Plainville and the surrounding communities where we had several meetings before the casino and report back to the people from Plainville and surrounding communities on the precisely what the social and economic impacts have been. So we're going to have a special meeting next Tuesday night in Plainville at 5.30. It'll also be streamed live on the web. Where's the meeting, Ed? Do, is it at Town Hall? Uh, no, it's at, the, at senior. the Senior Center in Plainville, Tuesday at 5.30. Okay. Right. Great. And we will have the minutes then. Uh, next up, Executive Director Pedrosian. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, just a couple updates before I get to with the uh, MGM opening update. Um, a couple of legal issues. You might have seen a letter sent to us um, by legal <coughs> representative Mass Gaming and uh, Entertainment, which was the uh, entity that applied for the Brockton license in Region C. They have asked the Commission to specifically reconsider the Brockton license. Um, staff is working, and that obviously implicates the Brockton uh, application. Yeah, the Brockton application. Yeah, thank you. The, the license, the Brockton application for the Regency license. Right. Um, that obviously implicates a lot of sort of Regency issues. Um, I've been working with the legal department and staff. I would anticipate that we would come back in front of the commission at our next meeting or sometime in July and have a proposed uh, response or process um, for the commission on that date for public discussion. Right, July 19th. At this point, it looks like it'll be right. July 19th, subject to right. potential movement. Right. Uh, the the nether, uh, another update is you might have seen that one of the principals of FBT has filed a lawsuit regarding the 2013 land transaction Everett. Um, just as a reminder, this is the third lawsuit um, from either FBT or princ uh, principals of FBT, the first one was against their former lawyers. The second one was against us. Um, the third one now is um, against Wynn. Uh, we will obviously conduct the appropriate review of that matter and continue to monitor the litigation, but I, you probably have seen it. So, right. But to be clear, the suit is, is by one of the landowners against Wynn, not uh, involving us. Correct. Yeah, the second one, the first one was against former lawyers. The second one was against us. Right. This now third one is against win, correct? Correct. So, uh, okay, on to the MGM opening update. Um, I'm uh, happy to tell you that things are, are going along um, at a very expeditious pace. That the construction is going along, um, you know, both incredibly fast and it's amazing to think of everything they will still need to get done. We were out there on Friday um, with our uh, our meeting, which will start to pick up in tempo with the MGM folks. Um, took a tour of the property. Um, we also have our, our gaming preparation school for new gaming agents and members of our gaming enforcement unit that's been happening. They spent the last two days here um, with a prominent um, teacher of table game cheating, um, giving them two days of both demonstrations and videos of, of various ways in which people have cheated and probably will attempt to continue to cheat in the, in the future. Um, so it was uh, uh, both very entertaining and informative and a little daunting to think of all the ways that people have come up with trying to uh, cheat. Um, so, uh, But it, cheaters should be aware that we know about them, all these things, because we have cameras everywhere 
it's a bad place to cheat. And, and that was, I think, that one of the takeaways is they just had all this video of all these things that, right. uh, that happened. So, and I will tell you uh, also, some of these cameras were historic views from years and years ago. And I've seen the cameras that are going in to, uh, to uh, MGM Springfield. It will be night and day in terms of the quality and clarity of right. the cameras. So even more of a warning. Uh, in terms of our uh, slot machine preparations, 2,500 slot machines on premise, um, 2,300, just over 2,300 are in place. The rest are probably waiting, you know, some minor final construction in areas before they can be secured and put in place. Um, 348 are actually verified. This was as of a couple of days ago. Um, but I know that our folks are, um, you know, picking up in speed and tempo. As the more they do, the better they get. So um, I, we would anticipate that we hopefully will have all the machines in place, verified with the state seal uh, by approximately the third week of July. So that is. Um, I, I do think it's appropriate to add a little humor here that uh, all of these 2,500 slot machines have been manufactured somewhere and shipped into uh, Springfield. <coughs> whereupon the uh, techs from MGM and from the Gaming Commission open them up to set them up. Um, one of those 2,500 um, new slot machines had inside it a baby possum. <laughs> Where did it come from? Not a mouse, a baby possum that uh, you'll be pleased to know was fed and released. <laughs> um, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was told uh, to expect the unexpected in this job, so <laughs> certainly that uh, fulfills that. Um, as far as hiring goes, a um, report from uh, MGM Springfield yesterday that they currently have 328 uh, employees. Approximately 29% of those are Springfield residents, but they expect that number to go up as the mass hiring starts. Really? What was, what was the number again? Right now, they have 328 onboarded okay. employees. 29% okay. are Springfield residents. Um, this is probably more upper management. I think they would expect Springfield residents to help fill in some of the service employees and gaming jobs, so they expect that number to go up. 2,200 job offers made. Um, and just under 800 left to make. Um, and they had a, a hiring event uh, this week on the 18th and 19th. They made 520 offers, and 53% of those were Springfield residents. Mm -hmm. so, um, so obviously that's, I think, the reflection of where they, th they, they think the numbers will come from. So that one, is- One other um, gratuitous comment. Um, we're all, I think, being hard, doing, being careful to try to um, keep our expectations down and not count our chickens till they hatch. But I must say that when Governor Baker went out and took the tour, Governor Baker, who's never been a, fi a fan of, of casino gambling, um, he was laudatory <laughs> about the project and really expressed enthusiasm and excitement about what you all are trying to do, what we all are trying to do, but particularly you all. So that's a credit. That was, that was impressive for him to put his almost emotions on the line like he did talking about it. So. We're all excited. Yep. So with that, that is the end of my <coughs> MGM update presentation. So I think that is it for me. Okay. Next up, Mr. Connolly. All right. I think we have a, a full uh, team from MGM coming up to join me. Um, so uh, two uh, items on the agenda today. First is uh, exemption requests, employee exemption requests. Um, there are 20 positions um, that are being put forward to you today for uh, exemption requests. The packet, you'll see there's 22, but two, uh, based on subsequent conversations we've had and, and a, uh, a more detailed understanding of, uh, of those facilities positions uh, and their work on the gaming floor, uh, we're, we're pulling those out for consideration. Um, so it's just the two. Uh, Bar barber and master barber MGM positions and the vendor positions um, that are being that we're recommending be considered today. Um, of note, there's a number of uh, vendor positions. So there's 18 positions for vendor employees. What they what that means is there are those 18 positions for in the entertainment block really between the movie theater, uh, Kringle Candle, and uh, Hanush Jewelers. Um, employees that will be working within the boundaries of the gaming establishment, uh, but uh, are working for a third-party vendor. 
uh, we're <coughs> requesting uh, that those be exempted. Uh, but importantly, several of those positions deal with the service um, of alcohol, particularly in the theater, um, and, and as well uh, to a much more limited degree at Kringle Candle. Uh, this is, you know, this is a, an important um, issue, and, and the way I framed it, and frankly, uh, agreed with um, MGM, and, and again, and MGM is doing this really on behalf of the vendors. If the uh, if er, this the casino were operational, frankly, we would have the vendors here themselves doing it. But it's obviously at a point in time at which it's much easier to have MGM kind of do that upfront representation in this process um, for the vendors. But um, I am recommending that they, uh, am forwarding these to your, for your consideration with a recommendation that they be um, exempted. The um, issue as I see it and as I thought about it and as we discussed it collectively is there's really two ways to look at it. The, the argument against exempting them is that these individuals will fall under um, the alcohol or the gaming beverage license that is still to be issued. Um, uh, that we administer, and so we take that very seriously, obviously, um, and and we would, you know, we don't exempt bartenders in the casino or on the floor um, or in the bar in the restaurants uh, at uh, at the casino proper. Why should we exempt these? That that's an argument against. The argument for is that, uh, as has been mentioned numerous times, the Springfield uh, Casino is really a different kind of endeavor, and the statute. Um, probably did not contemplate uh, the type of casino that, that is being put in place in MGM Springfield with movie theaters, with bowling alleys, with um, this level of, uh, of additional entertainment and retail, and that uh, the statute probably didn't even contemplate um, pulling uh, individuals like this into the, the licensing schema. Um, so, you know, we should maybe view it that way, and that, that kind of weighed heavily on my thought. As well, um, if there were any issues with either of these vendors or individual employees and their practices and how they dealt with alcohol service uh, and controls, um, you know, first and foremost, we would talk to MGM, right? And we would tell them that we're seeing problems or we're perceiving problems with the activities of, the, of their vendors and um, ask that they be corrected. If problems persisted, um, you know, it could put their license in jeopardy or a condition of their license. If theoretically one of those areas had uh, a lot of alcohol violations, commission could always condition it and remove that licensed area um, from the license, thereby removing the ability to serve alcohol. And, and thirdly, um, each of these vendors is, a, is registered with us as a non-gaming vendor, and that would put their registration in jeopardy if they continued to violate it. So I, I say that um, to express that uh, as we thought about the issue, uh, my concerns about licensing these individuals given their unique uh, roles is much lessened because we still have a number of ways that we could uh, exert influence and, and regulatory authority over um, uh, the employers, uh, particularly if not those specific employees through their registration. Questions or comments? Yeah, in, in having this conversation with Director Conley, I, um, I too obviously had concerns. But you know, my um, my experience with this is is individuals that are or near the floor, and this is quite removed. And secondly, your um, your thoughts and comments about um, the levers that we still have. Not that we expect mm -hmm. to have to use them, because I do expect. Um, MGM to properly supervise and, and, and take care of situations. Uh, they're experienced. Um, they uh, they don't want these issues. It's not in their in their um, best interest to have any kinds of uh, issues that would come to our attention. So, I was um, uh, persuaded that that this is uh, this is proper and the the risk is very minimal here. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm persuaded as well. I think you know, uh, there's um, the only difference here on uh, many of the of, of the <coughs> exemptions that we did for the entertainment block is that they're a vendor employee as opposed to an MGM employee, and I, I see that distinction really uh, of no consequence for the purposes of this discussion, especially when you point out that there's uh, uh, these um, um, controls and mechanisms that we have if any of these turn out to be an issue. I happen to think that uh, a background uh, is not um, a predictor necessarily of any of those uh, issues that we uh, talked about in terms of uh, potential concerns. 
but I, I agree with that recommendation, and I think it's um, it's a sensible request. Anybody else? I guess we need a motion, right? Uh, you do, and I just again, the, the packet um, contains 22 positions. At this point, we're only asking collectively that you consider 20 of those mm -hmm. to exclude uh, the two facilities positions. The, ver the first two. In the, the first packet. two. The first yes, we're, we're we're asking that you do not consider those for exemption at because this time. Because they do have a presence from time to time on the floor. That's correct. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd move that the commission approve. Uh, the gaming service employee exemptions uh, for the uh, MGM Springfield positions is included in the packet as well as the vendor employee positions as provided for in the packet. As amended by Director Conley. Yeah, with the exclusion. With the exclusion of the facility sound and in, in, uh, video um, staff positions. Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have unanimously. Great. Uh, so next up is the uh, application uh, for the gaming beverage license for MGM uh, Springfield. Uh, you'll note that we were here previously on uh, uh, in in late May uh, to introduce uh, the alcoholic beverage uh, license application, really for the, the casino itself as well as. Importantly, the 2 a.m. to 4 a.m., and there was a lot of discussion about that. Uh, what was outstanding at that time um, was the plan for the outdoor plaza area, and we had promised that we'd come back at a later date to discuss that in more detail, and, and today uh, is that date. Um, the hope is that today we could have a vote on uh, the alcohol beverage license, the gaming beverage license, um, in its entirety, and again, uh, remind the commission, you don't need to be reminded, but just to, to say it again, um, you can condition the license in any way you want. So the application is the application, but you can decide um, on, uh, on specific areas and, and condition it how you see fit. Um, there is of note, and I, I actually have the wrong memo in front of me, um, so I apologize if I don't have it off the top of my head, but there's a few things that we know that are outstanding. Um, that would be a, a condition of the license to, to, uh, that would want to follow up on, which is um, there are a number of those uh, tenants, um, the, the, for example, the theater uh, and uh, Kringle, that uh, we don't have the jointly responsible parties named as of yet. And also there is uh, an additional retail outlet uh, to be named. So because of where they are in their development process, they just don't have the names yet. We expect those once those are available and those would be added um, to the license uh, as a supplement. So just I want to make sure that that's clear that um, I'll be monitoring to make sure that information is submitted. Uh, but again, there's, um, there's the kind of what I think of as the standard um, gaming beverage license application for the casino um, and all the uh, adjoining areas, uh, including the entertainment block um, that was discussed at a previous meeting. There's the 2 to 4 a.m., you know, as you separate the issues, which is obviously um, of great significance. Um, and, and there's a specific plan about how to shrink the area and deal with that uh, drinking or, or alcohol service in, in that specific time frame. And the outdoor plaza, and again, the outdoor plaza is one that we touched on briefly, but um, MGM has worked to provide a lot more detail that you see uh, in the appendix uh, to the application. Um, so we, we've been working with MGM for quite a while on this, um, about uh, how they would secure the area, um, how they would define the area, because again, with outdoor, the concerns would be um, that if it was too porous, that people would you know, take their drinks off site and you know, kind of wander off into the, the local community, which wouldn't be desirable <coughs> uh, intentionally or unintentionally. Um, and also, uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, for normal, the normal course of events as well as special events, um, that security planning and surveillance uh, was sufficient to make sure that uh, incidents were not only kind of spotted um, and, and potentially warded off, but also uh, you know, that, that a robust response would be uh, imminent. Um, MGM provided us with a lot of that detail, obviously, and it's, it's in the, the packet. Um, and it was, I do want to say, it was a lot of uh, good collaborative work back and forth um, uh, between uh, the, 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 uh, the MGM folks and, and the commission. And so all that being said, uh, we deemed the application substantially complete with those few 
items still to be filled in. Uh, and uh, we feel that they've been responsive to the questions that um, we've posed to them. So I am forwarding at this point um, the gaming beverage license uh, to the commission with a recommendation that it be approved subject to any conditions that you see fit. Should we take this in two steps? I, I think I, the way I see it, I think there's kind of three, the three areas, kind of the, the, the general uh, license, the 2 to 4 a.m. and the outdoor. Right. Um, the outdoor kind of falls in with the general, so to speak, because it would be a lot of those same hours. That has nothing to do with the 2 to 4. Um, but, but I do, I think, as a, as a licensed area, um, deserves a specific discussion. Yeah, so let's, let's take the outdoor area first um, and confine our, confine our comments to that, unless somehow they overlap, and then we can move on to the two to four. Um, reactions to that plan as laid well, out in our books? I, I thought we were going to have uh, MGM speak to us about their specific we're, plans for the outdoor area. Yeah. I think we're probably now would be the appropriate sure. time. Yeah. Sure, and before I do that, if I could, um, we've heard I think twice in two contexts so far today, the exemptions and the, the exceptions to the license application um, vendors that we have yet to identify, one of them being the movie theater. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to Mike Mathis for a minute because we, we have identified that operator and um, are officially papered, and so I'd like Mike to be able to make that announcement and explain to you um, who's going to be operating our movie theater. Can I just get some credit for not letting it slip? Yeah, good job. <laughs> Thanks, Seth, and uh, thank you, Paul and Ed. You guys have been great um, working through this process, uh, Paul in particular, not just because you're giving us a couple of good recommendations this morning, but um, really you, you've kept, your staff has kept um, pace of our heavy workflow, and especially on the onboarding side. So I just I want to recognize that ongoing effort, um, which has been incredibly important. Uh, I am. I'm, thank you, Seth. I'm, I'm happy to announce our movie theater operator. Um, I always usually get the, the benefit of giving the good news, but in this particular case, I spent two long days in Knoxville, Tennessee, um, making sure we got this um, final agreement over the line. So um, I, I've got a lot of sweat, sweat and tears in this. But we're uh, we're partnering with Regal Cinemas to do a luxury seven screen um, movie complex. It's going to be uh, a great entertainment space, large bar space, um, great open space right on the uh, right on the retail plaza, and couldn't be more excited. This is their first venture into this part of the state. I think you've got a couple of regals on the eastern part of Massachusetts, but I think um, as we as we predicted, uh, we make the kind of investment we make, and we bring the kind of other quality uh, co-tenants to. Uh, a complex like um, MGM Springfield, and we'll, we'll attract national brands, um, brands that have uh, hadn't entered the market previously. So I think this is um, a, a, a great um, partnership that's going to really create that uh, mixed-use family experience that we've talked about, along with our bowling, and um, can be more excited to um, to have them as partners. Mm -hmm. Great. When you say great. luxury, does that mean Which only mean? the um, Reserved seats and the big reclining seats and everything, or, or some of that. Or what is that? What do you mean by luxury? No, exactly right. This is their uh, full leather. We call it full recline. Wow. Uh, in all, in all, I think it's about 650 seats or so, um, and they'll, they'll be service in the um, uh, premium service in the lobby. For instance, alcohol that is then you, you're allowed to bring into the theater. Um, having been through a couple of these experiences, uh, a movie's much better when you've got a beer or two. Uh, it's my experience, so. Uh, what is it? That's right. So really excited about it. And yeah, it'll be, it'll be and there's a couple of smaller theaters uh, within the seven that I think will give them the flexibility to do different types of movies in addition to the first run. So uh, they are, the Regals, Regals in the movie business, what we are in the, in the gaming business, which is really forward thinking. Uh, I believe they're the number two operator in the world. They've just uh, partnered with a large um, parent company out of, um, out of Europe. And uh, some of the stuff they're doing is, is really cutting edge, including uh, some of that innovative, um, I think they call it 40X, which is something that we're gonna look at in the future, which is you know that full immersive experience where the seats move. Um, uh, they th you know they throw mist at you, it sense at you. So this is a really forward-thinking company, and we're excited uh, to be partners with them. Mm -hmm. Great, congratulations. Thank you. That's great news. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, so I'll jump into the um, 
and I'm going to do a quick overview of the outdoor plaza um, proposal. And is this, can I flip using this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, great. So, um, <laughs> What I want to start off with is, um, I got to forward this, yeah, um, is, is why we're looking to do this. Um, you know, Springfield is really um, trying to develop a walkable entertainment district and activate downtown urban areas um, uh, within the city, and we think this is a really critical part of it. Some of the questions that we had previously received from the commission as well, um, is this, where has this been done before? Is it done successfully? Are there issues? And we looked right in our own backyard um, in Springfield. Uh, there are several uh, outdoor events that happen from time to time um, uh, in the downtown core that are very successful that involve um, entertainment and alcohol consumption outside in public areas. And those are generally run by uh, the Springfield Business Improvement District. Uh, we have joining us today to my right, Chris Russell, who's the executive director of the Springfield bid, uh, who runs these events, including White Lion Wednesdays, uh, cruise nights, et cetera. And, and so I've invited him here to just briefly address for the commission um, why, um, what the experience has been with customers and patrons appreciating this opportunity and doing it responsibly, as well as what it means for continuing to develop uh, downtown Springfield and activating the downtown area. So um, if, if you could, Chris, um, just briefly address that for us, we'd appreciate it. Sure. Thanks, Seth. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, good morning. I was asked to come just to speak with our experience of outdoor programming. Uh, we were redesigned and spent a lot of time and money um, in producing and promoting these uh, outdoor events. Uh, very successfully, uh, they were designed originally to draw people out of the office or to keep people in the downtown after work hours. Um, they've been qu they've quickly taken off. Very successful and are now not only keeping uh, the workforce in the downtown for a bit after work, but it's attracting people from the uh, greater region around Springfield. Uh, so the, uh, the biggest value to these events that we see is one, we've had zero incidents. That's absolutely zero. Um, they're mobile, so we're able to move them throughout different areas of the downtown that we deem see, you know, need to see attention or there's a new retail experience that we want to you know, highlight. So we move them around the downtown, and uh, they're, they've changed the dialogue about the city center and uh, its popularity and changing the public perception about safety. So um, if you have any questions about these events, we've been doing these new events for about four years. They, they happen weekly. We have three regularly uh, scheduled events, two of which serve alcohol today, and that's White Line Wednesday and our cruise night. Yeah, I would love to hear details about um, exactly um, what you do and how you keep it safe and secure. Sure. Um, part of that is in uh, tight management. Uh, we have uh, in place controls, both public and private security, that uh, that you know monitor the area. Uh, we don't have uh, extensive camera system for surveillance. Um, but everybody that works for the event has been uh, informed up front that uh, this has to be a zero tolerance of any type of issue that may pop up, arise. So we have private staff uh, that is hired for these events as well as uh, public police that are hired for these events to uh, monitor what's going on in the event. Um, controls in place are uh, making sure that uh, Anybody that's consuming alcohol is, of course, of age. They're TIP certified pourers that we use for all of these events. We work very closely with all the city departments. Uh, some of the events happen on public spaces uh, in our parks. Some of them happen in uh, private spaces, and that would be plazas uh, from some of our downtown towers. And uh, they're all monitored, and we have a, uh, you know, we have a zone that we allow the alcohol consumption to take place. Beyond that is, uh, you know, no go as far as uh, all the staff is concerned. We communicate that through signage, uh, orally, and uh, just how we market the events. We're bringing young professionals. Um, they're very, very successful. They include not only alcohol, they include non-alcoholic beverages, food, music, culture. Um, and they're really designed as social networking events, and they've been tremendously successful. And, and if I could, Chris, because Chris and I spoke about this very issue, uh, in advance, you know, our proposal, as you'll see, is going to have is will be much more 
secure from the standpoint of surveillance, um, active security barriers. Due to the size and the scope and the rotating location and their track record, um, they've worked very closely with the city um, to, to ensure that a lot of your controls are generally through education to patrons and, and folks having clearly delineated space and understanding the rules, and it's been very successful with zero incidents. So we, we believe that if we do the same thing and then layer on top of that um, hard barriers, fixed security posts, surveillance, um, a, a law enforcement presence on site um, regularly that w that um, that'll go above and beyond what um, you know the the bids had as a very successful model working closely with the city incident free. Mm -hmm. I, I will add one of the reasons why uh, when I was asked to come and, and speak to you uh, that I felt very strongly about uh, MGM having the ability to provide these type of events is because what we've done on a very small scale has changed the perception and the street activity of what we were used to five years ago in downtown Springfield. Um, so we now have young professionals, you know, really in highly visible areas, uh, mingling, enjoying themselves, having a good time. Again, a track record of over four years of zero incidents uh, in any way, shape, or form. And uh, I just think this will further our mission where we've spent a lot of, you know, we're funded by the property owners in downtown to uh, you know, challenge you know, challenge us in, in new ways of uh, creating a better environment downtown and having them weave into the fabric of downtown as opposed to keeping folks just internal. I think is very very important to the city. Yeah, the city of Boston does it does it uh, very successfully as well. Um, I uh, I have a question relative to uh, what you uh, alluded to. There's um, what what you communicate by signage and orally. Um, is there, in, in, in the events that you talk about where there's alcohol, um, how do you manage or how do you, um, is there a demarcation understood that people are not supposed to go beyond um, uh, for the consumption of alcohol? Yes, exactly. Um, all of our events, we have a site map in advance that uh, whether it's a public or private entity that's hosting the event or is the host site, um, we go over with their management, their security, um, where the, the confines of the area to serve alcohol. They're very soft borders. We don't want to make it seem like the OK Corral uh, with a very hard presence around the event. Mm -hmm. But they're very soft, but they're clearly defined. And whether they be plaza areas that have uh, you know, landscaping and boundaries around them, uh, street corners, uh, and we monitor those perimeters very carefully. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I can just add, I, I think uh, I, I've attended a, a number of these events, and to Chris's point, I think it really does highlight the best of downtown Springfield in, in, in terms of we always talk about as one of the most walkable cities um, in the Commonwealth, and, and has some beautiful backdrops between Court Square and some of the historic buildings. And every time I've been to the event, I've seen different people that you don't see in Springfield. And I think exposes them to really all the wonderful things that are going on downtown, including the young professionals in the community that we're building, uh, which includes our, some of our employees. I think I've talked to you in the past. We've got a number of our young professionals that are making the choice to live in market rate apartments across the street from uh, the project, and they and they they love it that they can um, walk to work and that they can, um, as a community, go to the local bars and restaurants together. Um, Mass Live does a. Um, does, does always does a review after the fact of sort of photo gallery of little candid shots of people that are participating in the events. And I'm always struck by the diversity of folks. You have people from Worcester and Ludlow and the Berkshires and um, Summers, Connecticut. And I think, uh, I think these type of outdoor events really speaks to the millennials and is something that's going to draw a, a different group of people to downtown and, and really expose them to um, the transformation that we're all doing down there. And I, I commend the bid. We're, we're members of the bid. And we're going to continue to support these type of events, including hopefully in our plaza. Mm -hmm. yeah, great, thanks, Mike. And I'm, I'm glad to raise the Mass Live piece. That, uh, as Chris spoke to, it really helps with the the image of people seeing people downtown Springfield having fun. Uh, the risk is that um, you're in photos. And I, I told my wife last week that I was working late, and the next day. I was on the front page in a uh, White Line Wednesday photo. And she said, oh, really? You're working late. So there's a little risk when the, the, all the photos are online. Um, so 
what are, what are the hours of your um, activities? Uh, the hours vary uh, on the event. Uh, most of the events, uh, the afternoon to the evening events, start at 4 p.m. And uh, some go from 4 to dusk, which would be cruise night. White Line Wednesday may go a little bit later into the evening, about 9 p.m. And then we host uh, different music events. We have a jam fest that we actually raise uh, awareness and uh, funds for NAMI, which is the National Alliance for Mental Illness. That is an all-day, all-night event, and that goes from 10 a.m. till 12.30 p.m. Um, so depending on the event and how it's advertised and how it's structured, uh, the hours do vary, but most of them do start early afternoon and go and, into... And, the, and the, uh, the alcohol is served until 12.30 in those? No, we actually shut alcohol for the later event. We shut that an hour before the event... Uh, 11.30. ...closes, yes. <clears throat> Great, thank you, Chris. So. Um, I'll proceed through, and I want to highlight um, really what are the elements that we've worked through very carefully with staff to, to ensure that we have a safe um, and responsible experience in our plaza. And um, at a high level, excuse me, Seth. Yeah, I, sure. I just got a text message a couple of minutes ago saying that our meetings would be a lot better with a couple of beers too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we will. We will. Um, we propose limiting the hours of operation uh, for for of the plaza uh, for consumption of alcohol to uh, midnight. Um, we propose 24-7, um, 365 days of surveillance coverage of the entire plaza. Uh, we will ensure that alcohol is only consumed from plastic containers um, and when it, outside of licensed areas. And so that's a, um, there will be a few patios that are licensed areas themselves where, for instance, tap, you'll be able to sit outside and have a glass of a beer, but if you were to leave that licensed area into the plaza, then you'd have to convert to plastic. Uh, we'll have robust security protocols, including signage, which you'll see an example of in a moment. Um, fixed uh, security post, which is one of the um, uh, items we worked through with staff. We had originally intended to have a, a full-time fixed position, but agreed that it made sense to control one of the larger areas, which we'll show to you. Um, uh, some additional bollards to add uh, perimeter delineation, um, perimeter fencing, and roving security. We also have um, industry-leading alcohol uh, beverage uh, training, uh, responsible um, alcohol service training um, for all of our employees. And um, we will have an incentive program for employees to, to report um, any uh, minors um, found consuming alcohol or uh, any violations of, of um, the law or our reg or um, our rules. What do, you, um, what do you mean an incentive program? And so you actually um, you get um, gift certificates, for instance, for um, for reporting of uh, successfully reporting a violation. Wow. So we have internal incentive uh, programs to incentivize um, self-reporting um, uh, internally. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Again, we, we propose si a combination of signage, security posts, surveillance, and perimeter delineation. Um, here you'll see on this slide is what um, our signage would look like. Um, and, and I'll show you in a minute where those would be posted. Uh, we'll have a combination of fixed security and roving security. Our roving security will generally be on bicycles. Um, uh, we have um, high definition um, PTZ, which uh, uh, Executive Director Bedrosian just learned last week means pan, tilt, zoom. Um, uh, monitoring the plaza so we have full coverage uh, by our surveillance team. Quick, Seth, quick question. Typically surveillance, that the responsibility is not to, um, imp, uh, is not to monitor, I mean, they monitor everything but not specifically uh, to be part of your um, alcohol consumption you know, I mean, so you're, are you going to train security, in other words, uh, rather surveillance folks to really look at that plaza and look for violations? Is that part of their training? Because that's typically not their role. Yeah, um, that, that's a fair question, and um, we don't have our surveillance uh, executive here, but I, I think generally the answer is no, it won't be active, uh, actively, we won't be actively looking for um, underage drinkers through surveillance, but what it will allow us to do is to really evaluate what's going on in the plaza, um, see when there are, maybe there's an issue developing, or retrospectively figure out where the problems are, where 
if, if we're finding that people are getting in or there, there is an issue with, um, we hope there won't be, but if there is an issue with um, folks being able to, say, find a corner where they can hand off a beverage to an underage, mm -hmm. we'll be able to have that, that ability to analyze what's going on and make adjustments in our program based on uh, it being fully surveilled. That was my next question. The biggest um, <clears throat> problem that I'm aware of with outdoor drinking facilities is the ability for a person over 21 to then hand an alcoholic beverage to someone in the crowd who is underage. Um, so how will you be, how many, first of all, how many drinks will you allow one person to come up and, and buy that they then take back out into the plaza? Okay, uh, this is where I'm gonna invite the other two folks we have with us, our um, mm -hmm. head of food and beverage and uh, head of security. To, to join us, maybe if you could switch out, because I think they'll be able to uh, help answer those questions more directly. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Good morning. Jason Rucker, Executive Director of Security for MGM. So first thing I want to talk about real quick is the difference between surveillance and security. So we have two separate monitoring rooms where surveillance is going to focus, as you know, on the floor and the gaming aspect, where my team is more focused on the perimeter and the non-gaming aspect. So it's a completely different set of eyes. They're looking for different items. Mm -hmm. Okay. My question was about um, specifically uh, one individual buying drinks and then taking it back out to the plaza? Yes. It would be one drink per, per guest. Okay. You walk up, you're not allowed to buy. We would follow the normal laws of the Commonwealth where, no, you know, we're not going to serve pitchers of beer. It's going to be so one beer for one guest. It's usually two in, in lots of locations. You can buy two drinks and take it out. So you're, you're only allowing one, one. drink. So Correct. an individual comes it, out. It, this is just for the outdoor plaza. Okay. We would just allow one. If you're inside a bar in Massachusetts, you can get two. Yes. Or Fenway yeah. Park, you can get yes. up to two. Yes, that's my point. That's but the that's law, But because too. the whole area is licensed as a bar or so. Yes. Yeah. So one drink. One okay. drink. That should help with that issue then. Thank you. And there's no pictures serving in Massachusetts either. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, so. W We've broken this down, our plan to basically our standard operations and then special event. And uh, I'll, go, I'll go through these and we're happy to answer any questions. But so during our standard operations, um, which I'll actually um, flip to the map, I think it's easier, easier to look at here. But what we've done is we've identified um, what we propose to be the area of permitted alcohol consumption within Armory Square and the plaza. And you'll notice we've carved out a few areas from the overall uh, perimeter because it's allowed us to more um, narrowly control the access points. And so what you'll see grayed out um, areas one through six are what we've identified as really the only access points to, the, to that plaza. Um, certainly the largest one is area one, which it looks like an under, um, upside down question mark. And that is the, um, that is the um, rotary on, on Howard Street. Um, and um, so talking about that one first, because that is really the, the largest area, um, we have a combination of um, bollards around, uh, around the cul-de-sac itself to delineate that you're stepping off of property. We'll use signage, the signage we showed you earlier, um, to, to indicate that alcohol is not allowed beyond that point. Um, but then as you go up the street, the, the bollards uh, trail off, and there is some open access. And so in working with staff, we said, well, um, what, what we could propose to really ensure that that area is protected is that we have a fixed security post uh, there. And you'll see that indicated. Uh, there's, a, there's a small dot. It's hard to read from a distance. But you'll see the red um, line of sight uh, from that security post uh, showing where that security post would be able to monitor, covering that entire area, be able to um, detect and intervene uh, to the extent that um, uh, individuals were either purposefully or inadvertently stepping off of property with, with an alcoholic beverage. Is, uh, that, is, is that what's demarcated here as area one, Seth? Correct. That's the point that then you can 
Correct. look in both directions, yep. say that's the demarcation? That's right. And so um, we work with uh, Jason and his team, and he will have um, a, a physical post. Um, well, physical is not the, he will have a, a, a there won't be officer a, posted. an officer posted. So um, that will be their permanent post. They switch out in what, to three hour shifts? Three hour shifts that will rotate. Um, but there will be someone there full time monitoring uh, and likely to be more of a customer service uh, in reminding people. Um, just a reminder, you can't step off property if someone looks like they're going, um, going to do that. And I think through um, constant vigilance and communication, people will get the message very quickly and we'll be able to monitor and ensure that um, we don't have uh, any issues. Um, moving on, areas two, three, um, four, and five are very similar. They're very narrow um, areas, uh, breaks and fencing um, that um, uh, someone could pass through um, off-site and we're proposing that a combination of uh, signage um, and um, clear demarcation through through borders um, adjacent to those areas as well as a ro roving security would be sufficient to protect against really any issues where you have any sig material um, uh, issue with folks coming and going from the property with with um, alcoholic beverages and those are really the um, when you see the property on site, those feel like the back of the property and there we really don't anticipate high volume, but we feel confident that because they are um, narrow um, and through signage and roving security, we could easily um, uh, protect those. And then the final one is area six, which um, is a slightly larger area going onto Union Street. Um, we've proposed adding additional bollards that didn't previously exist to uh, assist with the demarcation of that as a property border, along with um, signage. Uh, and you'll see that there is a surveillance camera. Surveillance cameras are indicated in the yellow dots um, right at that spot um, that can help us um, uh, when roving security isn't present um, to have the ability to, to monitor um, that, that area. So we feel comfortable that in a steady state, um, uh, again, this will be um, not a special event, so we don't anticipate really high volume. These protections will be sufficient to ensure a safe and responsible experience outside. Can I go? Can you go back for a minute? So you're proposing there, there will not be any con consumption on the park. Correct. Uh, the park, although we will, um, we will uh, basically run and maintain the park under a license agreement with the city. That is a city uh, property. It's not part of the gaming establishment, so it would not fall under our gaming beverage license. We do anticipate, however, from time to time, we may work with the city um, to put an event on there. And at that um, time, we would do a special event license through the city, uh, similar to what uh, Chris what does. What Chris was bid. precisely um, talking yeah. about. OK. Yeah. And um, so just just so I get that uh, the clear, the, the line between the park and what's the back of the armory, is there going to be fencing? Did you talk about earlier about fencing? So. Um, all along the perimeter of the park, um, there is fencing. That area actually, um, and it's, it's hard at this distance, but that area is open not directly into the park, but you could take a left and get over to the um, Howard Street um, uh, cul-de-sac. So you could, area two, you could come out, you could pass through there, not get into the park because that's fenced, but walk. There's a little corridor uh, on the backside of the armory that could bring you out to uh, the Howard Street uh, cul-de-sac, and then you could get on the street. So um, there's some bike racks back there. That's somewhat of a back alley. Um, um, it'll be a pretty back alley, but a, a back alley nonetheless. So um, we don't anticipate high volumes there at all. So is it fair to say then that most circulation is going to be on the other side of the armory, closer to the entertainment? Um, Absolutely. Just, just given the sort of barriers there are absolutely for, for uh, virtually condition. we anticipate virtually all circulation yeah. between what we're calling armory square which is the piece on the left and the plaza will be between the armory and the and the entertainment block building mm -hmm. seth in yeah. area six um you talk about roving security personnel what's a time frame or schedule when folks are out there Jason, if you could speak to 
how you do that? So in the plaza area, there'll be three security 24 seven basically. So the one fixed post at the top of the area one that we spoke about and then two patrols that are just constantly going around the plaza. If there's an issue, they respond to it and they go back around through their patrols. Mm -hmm. It would just seem to me that, I mean, you benefit, I think in some respects from having kind of choke points or narrow points, but obviously the cul-de-sac and that exit at the end on the Union Street seem a little more wide open where you might be more prone to find somebody trying to walk off property with a beverage, so. Yeah, when the area one's gonna be a much uh, higher traffic area just because Main Street's right there. If you come outside of area six on the Union Street right there, there's not a whole lot going on to go to, so it's gonna be a lot lower traffic volume. So that's why we thought the roving patrols would be a, a better bet than posting somebody there who's really not doing a whole lot. We feel that to the extent that there were issues um, on Union Street, that, that the issue on Howard is more could be inadvertent, and that's why we're really making an intense effort to make clear the delineation and have a fixed security post so people don't wander. Um, on the Union Street side, it would really be more intentional um, because there's really nowhere to go um, if you're if you're going out, out that side. Um, so we think it, it uh, because it's really a low volume issue, um, we can control it through the roving security and surveillance and signage. Uh, the busier map, which I brought up, is what we are proposing. Now, this isn't a specific event. This is a sample event, but how we would deal with higher volume events, ticketed uh, events, uh, concerts, um, activations of the plaza, where it's not just your day to day um, folks from inside the casino deciding to walk out. And, and you know, have a smoke in the smoking area or watch something on the screen while finishing their drink or walk across the top golf. This is where we're really activating the plaza <coughs> with um, potentially hundreds of people. You'll see a lot of enhancements here, um, primarily um, the enhancements involve um, perimeter fencing uh, for that event as well as uh, event security. You'll see the stars, depending on where the event's taking place, we would really surround um, the activation with a combination of, of um, perimeter delineation and uh, security personnel to ensure that um, we don't have um, folks w w with that volume spreading out into public areas or and that they're incident free. Would that be uh, like the velvet uh, bank teller type? Um, or what, what do you mean by fencing? It really depends on the kind of event. It could be the velvet ropes or it could be a pedestrian barricade. It's just if it's a concert, most likely the pedestrian barricade. If it's more of uh, watching the game, probably then the velvet rope. So it just depends on the event. Could you explain what a pedestrian barricade yeah. is? So the pedestrian barricade are the steel kind of bike rack looking barricades. They're about eight feet in length and a little heavier. Connect each other on, yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. okay. And just the final piece is that um, we take uh, training of our employees very seriously. Um, we have um, uh, a very comprehensive program uh, to ensure that not only are we um, properly um, carting people, but that we're looking for signs of intoxication. And that's going to be, uh, whether it be in the plaza or in the building, the culture that we set um, on property is one of um, responsible service and consumption of alcohol. And um, that culture will, will spread both indoors, outdoors. And I think, um, I, you know, one, <laughs> One comment um, Anthony Caratazola, who's with us here today, I think made to uh, Paul and Ed in some of our discussions around you know, conditions and monitoring. And he said, don't, wor don't worry. If there's issues, we're going to shut it down before you ever have to shut us down. Because that's um, one, I think he mentioned that his name is on every, as the manager on every license area. So he's a little bit concerned. Um, but the culture that our company sets around ensuring that um, we, we have a safe and responsible environment, we take it very seriously. And we're confident that we can do that. Um, uh, activate the plaza and, and activate downtown um, in a way that um, is responsible and creates a great experience. And, and if we have issues, we'll independently um, either pull back or, or change the approach before we ever have to um, have any enforcement issues. Uh, with that, if there are any questions, uh, any one of us are happy to address. Uh, when you mention plastic cups, are we talking disposable or the reusable? So it's a recyclable plastic cup that we're actually switching 
for when we do our cutoff period after 1, 1 a.m., mm -hmm. we switch to a plastic cup so we know at 2 a.m. when we stop our service, we know it's actually alcohol in the glass and not a non-alcoholic beverage. Right. So, so if somebody were to leave the property, they would have a, this is, it would be quite obvious that this is a, um, a reusable, not a disposable. They can't just throw it away. I mean, they could, but it's... It's, yeah, it's, um, it's not that, it's not more, it's not a souvenir type glass at all. It, it's more of a, is there, a logo on it? there is a logo on it, but it's very, right. Right. Um, it's not something you would reuse a couple of times. If you probably washed it once, it wouldn't hold up in a dish. But it, it, it'll, it'll be clear that it's an MGM Springfield cup because it'll Correct. have a gold right. line on it. Okay. Thank you. I, I have a question that's more directed to Director Pedroji and or Paul. What, um, Understanding all the specifics of the license, uh, how they plan to treat outdoor events, how do they plan to treat service uh, during two to four, what type of training are we doing with our gaming agents or with the you know, combined MSP and SPD units so that they're aware of all of the issues, circumstances that might arise during the execution of some of these events? Sure. So. Um I was just looking around to see if Director Band was present, but I think, oh, he is, he is present. There he is at the back. Um, so we've had <clears throat> conversations about this. Our gaming agents are sort of the frontline enforcement people for us and the ABCC at our locations. Um, so we will, depending upon the conditions on the license and the areas, then we will work with our gaming agents to figure out how to uh, work on enforcement. Um, and they also do, in addition to underage drinking, um, they also have responsibilities at the particular designated um, uh, beverage areas. Are taps being secured at the appropriate times? How is liquor stored? Um, so they, they have a, in addition to the gaming responsibilities they have, they have a whole nother set of beverage responsibilities. And I think, um, I remember, I think we had one or two issues early on at PPC on unsecured liquor. Um, so that was a, an issue that was discovered by our gaming agents. Um, our GEU folks, our game enforcement, our state police and Springfield police, traditional law enforcement um, authority also. So underage drinking obviously is a crime. Providing uh, alcohol to a minor is a crime. Um, so those were things that could be investigated. We have the regulatory component with our gaming agents. We have the criminal component with the GEU part. So that would be the role in which those two entities would play. And can I just mention the ABCC agent because uh, you, you mentioned as well. Um, so I'll remind uh, everybody that we fund uh, yes. um, the gaming uh, monies fund um, one ABCC agent who has been stationed mostly at Plain Ridge uh, for all those uh, uh, eventualities that you, uh, uh, that you spoke about. And um, will probably go to MGM Springfield and is essentially for the better part of the, uh, the, the opening months, is my, is my guess, will eventually float between three properties. Uh, but just for reference, uh, there's 10 agents uh, at the ABCC for the state as a whole. So then the amount of alcohol supervision uh, that's dedicated for these casinos is substantial, not just because it's leveraged with uh, our gaming agents and, and, and the GEU people, and you know, um, of, of course the um, uh, security and surveillance um, on events and whatnot, but because there's a dedicated agent to the, from the ABCC as well. That's correct, thank you for reminding me. And um, commissioners, I just want to mention one thing that uh, came to mind when I first walked the site with the MGM staff, which was, um, I think I was more familiar with outdoor events that had set perimeters, um, and usually much smaller, obviously. If you go down to the Greenway here, Trillium has a, uh, a space, Trillium Brewery has Planters, a space. Yeah. yeah, exactly, it has a, a set outdoor perimeter. So we had the discussion about, you know, could you sort of harden this perimeter with some type of, whether it was the, uh, and I did distinguish between the velcro rope or the, uh, the bike racks. Um, and uh, uh, it's specifically, and I think they're right, there are a couple of natural choke points 
that seem to sort of define define uh, a flow itself. But if you look at the bottom of Howard Street, the cul-de-sac, there is sort of the big open area, and one that might be the most, uh, or that area, area one might be the most um, used area. Uh, what I learned, and maybe the MGM folks can comment on this, is from a sort of life and safety issue, having, and there are a set of, there are a set of major doors across the, the patio there to the casino area, uh, that having uh, even things like velvet ropes or any type of barricades and in a area where you might have to do a, you could potentially have to do a mass evacuation of the building uh, presents uh, uh, substantial challenges. So I think what I heard from the folks is they're trying to blend that life and safety issue with the alcohol oversight issue. Um, and that's where the ballards, the planting, and then eventually the permanent security officer come in. Um, but I just want to make sure that that was the issue I took away from those conversations. That's right. We explored really every option we could to try to add delineation and perimeter. And, and when we explored trying to, to use change or other items on that uh, Howard Street, we did run into the issue of we have, um, I think, building capacities generally in the 14 to 15,000 um, persons uh, range. And so from a life safety evacuation standpoint, that um, it basically areas one and six, if, if you had to flow out of the casino through those main doors, those would be the primary points of egress into to safer areas. And, um, and adding restrictions around those could create significant issues with that, um, that volume of flow. And so we had to get creative around how would you how would you really delineate that border, but not um, negatively impact. Um, and frankly, uh, um, we would have to restudy the entire um, uh, life safety evacuation program if we were to put harder barriers in those two areas. Um, which which um, and Jason, feel free to add anything I missed on on that point. No, I, I think you hit it right on the head. Just adding any kind of impediment to a mass egress when people are panicking to get out. It, it, it's not a good thing to do. Can I ask you, you talked about the plastic cups for the outside spaces. Is that all the time or just after a certain hour? How does that work? No, there's, gla there's no glass allowed on the plaza area. It's always going to be in plastic. So if I have a glass drink I got at the bar inside and then I want to go outside, it, it'll be walk switched me out. through how someone says, it'll sorry, be you have to switch out and how does it happen? So the, the, the two doors, it, we, we do this in theaters, so it's a very similar process where we don't allow glass in any of our, our showrooms or our theaters. So basically when you're walking out the doors, you're going to have, you're going to be asked to switch it into a plastic cup. And okay. then if we do any service out there when we do our special events, um, if, if it's beer, it'll be served in an aluminum, aluminum can or an aluminum bottle. Um, any liquor will be in a plastic cup. So is the ID checked again at that transfer point or only the first time they get the drink? Usually just at the first time. Is there, and there was some discussion, I think, um, in my head too, about the use of wristbands that people are going to be milling around the property to make it easy to identify that someone isn't passing off this plastic cup. Um, can you address the feasibility of that, particularly if they're going to have to swap a glass cup out anyway? Well, it's certainly, so we've talked about it in two, two aspects. One, special events, and we've uh, indicated that that's something we would employ in special events due to the high volume uh, and, the, and what we showed on here uh, to be really a controlled perimeter with uh, security presence. It would be uh, really feasible and make sense given the volume to do that. Once um, in kind of your steady state normal operations, um, uh, it's, it would be much more challenging and impact our customer experience, for instance, uh, to the extent that you have to, any time you want to walk outside to go to Top Golf or, um, or uh, say, step out to have a smoke, um, find a way to get a wristband on, and it could create one staffing issues for us, and also customer experience issues where um, it has, um, uh, it's one thing in a special event, but where it has almost a little bit of a amusement park feel if you've got to wear a fluorescent wristband every time you go inside and outside. And so from a customer experience standpoint and logistically, um, we feel that it's, it's, not, it's not feasible. 
uh, or necessary to do that given, um, given the other protections we have in place. And I don't know if, if there's anything you want to add. Uh, okay. But isn't, I mean, in terms of experience aside or, you know, the ambiance aside, if they have to swap the cup out anyway, how much, they're only needing the band if they're going to drink alcohol outside. So how much more of an inconvenience is it? You can step out and have a smoke and come back in without the band. It would only be if you want to be able to drink alcohol outside. I think if you have the drink in your hand, though, and you're walking outside, you get it switched out if you're going to smoke, you would still, how, we're not going to know if they're going to smoke or if they're going to top golf. So we would have to literally band everybody. Um, and I think from a staffing standpoint, positioning people at those doors, basically from 10 a.m. till midnight, we, we would need at some points, you know, three to four employees just to manage the doors. I, I don't know if it's a, it, it would be very clunky because you're going to slow traffic down. And then on top of it, you have our walkways that are designated. You're crossing that walkway and you're, you're kind of bottlenecking traffic and, in. And if, if I could, I think, so the bands go to also, as I understand the concern, kind of identifying minors. Is that the, is that the yeah. primary concern? That's part of it, yeah. Yeah. So keep in mind that it's less of an issue on the casino floor because that's controlled and there are no minors on the floor. But throughout the remainder of the gaming establishment indoors, it's the same issue. Um, uh, you can walk around um, freely with an alcoholic beverage uh, with, with uh, adults and minors uh, interacting. And um, we believe that through, through education, through security, um, uh, and monitoring that we're going to be able to create an environment where minors don't have access to alcohol. And so the plaza is really an extension of the remaining indoor areas of, of the facility off the gaming floor. We're going to have that combination of um, adults and minors. Um, and to, to require, um, I guess the extension of that would be then really requiring wristbanding of anyone off of the gaming floor, which would create, which but again, experience-wise, logistic-wise, could create, create a significant issue. So we, we feel that, based on our experience in other properties and the resources, that, um, that we could accomplish it without that. And, and I think Paul spoke to in the beginning, there's, the commission has the ability to condition and to relook at, to the extent that we're having issues, which we're, we're of course, self-reporting, we could revisit um, and look at a different procedure if there are significant issues. Again, we don't anticipate there will be. Um, I, um, I actually like and will favor the recommendation. Uh, I was going to say this later, but I'll say now. I think um, creating barriers, the, the whole point of the design um, of this casino is to try to activate the plaza, to not make it uh, that, that fortress, that old style casino where they just want you in and want to keep you in. Um, the idea of the, the armory, the renovation, the, 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 the design concept of this is, um, is about having some activity. Um, and I think uh, alcohol is one that will enhance it. If we were not to license in this area the, the alcohol, it would act as a barrier. Um, I think for towards that activation. It's not a dispositive. They will still be able to do programs there. It's just not going to be the same ability to do the programming uh, that, they're, that they've been talking about. So I, I, gener I favor this. I think there's a lot of systems and controls that we can uh, put in place, like they have done successfully uh, um, at, in the city, like they do it here in downtown Boston um, on a number of, uh, of different areas uh, that we're very familiar with. Um, so I, I think this would be a good um, uh, reason to see that activation, uh, um, uh, which is the whole intent of the design. And we could always come back and revisit this um, uh, in terms of hours, in terms of controls or, or, um, or barriers. <coughs> I actually happen to think that some of the existing barriers are a little too restrictive. I want it to be more, more of a natural flow, but I understand that you have to strike a balance between having an area that you can control with, you know, some um, monitoring and roving uh, security, uh, et cetera. But um, I, I, I generally favor this, uh, this request. 
Other questions or comments? Yeah, I, I generally favor the outdoor, uh, the outdoor plan as presented. I did want to go back, if we can, um, Mr. Chairman, to talk about some of the other spaces that you have licensed. I know we're going to talk about the two to four issue, but um, reading some of the local um, follow-up to the original presentation, uh, laying out a license opportunity for Kringle Candle and Indian Motorcycle, uh, just to make sure I'm on the right page, it's to dispel the notion that, hey, you can walk into those places at any time and get a beer. It's more that if you guys wanted to have a special event within those spaces, that you'd have the opportunity to do that without having to come back for a special license. It wouldn't be Kringle Candle for a glass of wine at 10 a.m. in the morning, unless you had the event going on, but it's not that all of those places will be serving alcohol on a regular daily basis. That's correct. That's still uh, my understanding. That's okay. correct. The, the various of the license areas will be activated only um, on a limited basis, on an event basis. Um, the, um, you know, Kringle Candle experience is not going to compete. You know, tap is right across, um, across from it. Tap, you're going to be able to have a number of beers on tap, any cocktail you like. Um, they're going to have um, uh, interact closely with the farmer's market and the ice skating rink. And so some of the concepts that we've discussed is, do you have um, hot toddies that you can get at the Kringle Candle next to the ice skating rink? Uh, or do you have some some um, kind of limited boutique craft drinks that are consistent with what they're doing there and the experience that's in the plaza um, would be out of Kringle. Armory is going to be on an event basis. Uh, and so, so I think what you're suggesting is right. This isn't going to be a um, full-time full -time bar scene in each one of the licensed areas. There are certain areas that that is one of the primary focus, including TAP um, and a center bar, but um, various of the outlets are, are more, um, more, much more limited and event-driven. And, and Commissioner Stevens, to that point, too, that was one of the things we had discussed early on, which was in, in some of these areas where the alcohol service may be infrequent, including it in the license. So one, it could be part of this discussion um, and really cover it in a comprehensive fashion and to provide MGM with the flexibility to activate it without having to um, submit a, a special event permit because while infrequent, it will probably be somewhat regular and it, it didn't make sense to, to go the latter route. Okay. Um, no, I was just going to say, you know, obviously at the appropriate time, I want to talk about two ideas uh, for putting conditions on the license, but we can do that at the appropriate point. Not relative to the outdoor space. Uh, relative to the whole to the whole thing. liquor license, but obviously, you know, what they're suggesting and planning for the outdoor space is kind of unique. I mean, it's it's uh, it's even though we've had great local examples of where it worked, um, and the other piece being the two to four. Again, these are both kind of unique pieces. Um, you know, I would suggest that. Uh, we do kind of a, a three-month or a 90-day review that will take them from August almost into November when some of the plaza activity may be kind of winding down because it gets a little colder. Um, but I also want to have us discuss possibly uh, authorizing the ED to have the ability to suspend a portion of the license. Not that we're expecting trouble, but give them that opportunity to either suspend any part of the license until they can have a chance to modify or review or uh, correct a, a strategy for compliance. So those, those are both really good ideas. Did you get a chance to finish your presentation? Um, I'm looking at your last page here on uh, the uh, training and responsible serving. Did you want to mention that before uh, we? I did. Cover it briefly, okay. Commissioner. Um, when I was talking about the culture, uh, the culture okay. of compliance in our training program. So okay, no, good. I'm I, I'm fine unless there are any. Yeah, I, I mean, I just or, had a question sure. about techniques for slowing down consumption, and um, kind of the effects of over intoxication. You mentioned those two areas, and I just just uh, maybe Jason would be the appropriate person. I'm not sure to talk about that. 
So some of the techniques for slowing down consumption is strike up a conversation, not from coffee or food or something, or just slow down the speed of service in general. So mm -hmm. do like a 20-minute round time instead of a 10-minute round time. So mm -hmm. the bartenders and the servers have all these tools at their disposal. We just need to know how to utilize them, which we teach them in this training class. Mm -hmm. And what was the other piece of it? Um, the effects of over-intoxication, dealing with the uh, intoxicated guest. I'd be interested in... Um, um, I know those are challenging uh, events, so I just was interested in your experience in, in yeah. those areas. So the, the first step of any of it before you give them any alcohol at all is to, to size them up. Even mm -hmm. when they're coming on property for the first time, we're going to have a conversation with them. How are you doing tonight? What, what are your plans? Where do you want to go? So to provide customer service. But if they're not answering the questions quite correctly or they're showing they're already intoxicated, then we're going to go to our next steps, which if it's a food or beverage person is to call security. And then we get involved mm -hmm. and, and speak to them and figure out what we need to do on that, that next piece. And to recognize the signs of over-intoxication, we're looking for that slurred speech, the uh, rapid changes in mood, just things like that. And then that's how they assess it and then bring us into the loop. And I think it's important to clarify on that piece that um, while our servers and managers are trained to identify situations of over-intoxication, over um, they don't engage in the process of shutting, shutting mm -hmm. folks off. That's, um, and, Jason could mm -hmm. speak to this, but they, the, the cocktail server, uh, if they, they notice it, they get a manager, a uh, manager observes, and they call security, and any interaction with the guest in terms of their state of intoxication or refusal to drink is handled by security and not by, um, not by servers. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know that uh, at PPC we've been successful um, with our, um, you know, working as a team, gaming agents, uh, state police, um, Plainville police, as well as security as a force multiplier, um, and really working, getting people into Ubers, but then actually looking at that event after the fact. Um, okay, so we had to put this person in an Uber. Let's go back to the video, and and maybe they have identified a bartender who, who did overserve, and it's a training opportunity I mean, I'm just hopeful that the same thing um, will occur. It's a larger scale. There'll be more incidents. I'm very hopeful that that team approach can be successful here. Yeah, typically, so what happens is security will do a report and the <coughs> cutoffs. Mm -hmm. It's emailed to myself. Then we, we actually, I sit down with the beverage team, the beverage manager, and then the employee, and we have a coaching session and, and discuss next steps. Usually over two, three infractions, we start moving to, or actually two infractions, we start moving to discipline, depending on the infraction. Um, so usually we get ahead of this way before it gets out of hand. Okay. And uh, just to one, one point on the outdoor uh, consumption and, and the security plan surrounding special events, on, you know, speaking of the teamwork, um, I know it's been discussed that, uh, you know, prior to any special event, there'd be a lot of coordination between MGM um, and uh, the gaming agents and the GEU to identify, you know, the anticipated number of, of people coming in, what that security plan looks like, and as a matter of fact, uh, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but that will be part of the security submission. Yeah, correct. Right. So that again, you know, th this th there's a will be um, they, they've indicated there will be a lot of forethought in terms of planning for security, and that will be clearly communicated well in advance um, with you know, in a partnership fashion with the GEU, with the gaming agents. And, and I, I'd actually request that as not only part of security submission, but as part of the license, mm -hmm. that there be a staff level approval with the GEU of the whole activation of the plaza area so that we would work, obviously, in the next month or so together. Um, you know, we saw physical surveillance, I mean, physical barriers we think that could be enhanced, keeping in mind life and safety discussions, um, if there was a surveillance, if there was, you know, for example, that back alley, the, um, the luxurious back alley as it's been described, um, you know, someone from uh, gaming agents or, or state police uh, said it, it might be better to have a camera back there. We'd have authority to do that um, before we gave uh, uh, final approval for the beverage license at that area. And I think, um, I'm not looking to put more work, but I think that final approval and the, the dialogue between now and then could help prevent issues um, that might just pop up if at the end they follow this, whatever 
model they had there, and we found out later on we wanted to add conditions. So, and that we'd also work with the ABCC person mm -hmm. on that also. Absolutely. Um, I was going to make a, another point uh, about my point about barriers earlier, and and, and that is that uh, you know it's also a responsible gaming uh, aspect to allow people to go outside, um, even if they have a drink halfway and they can finish up, to take breaks. Um, I think it's an important feature. Let's not forget that everybody who might be going to the casino is going there to gamble in the first place. Um, so I um, I like uh, the the notion that you, they'll be able to. Um, walk in and out, again, depending on what's going on in the plaza, uh, um, and you've thought of it accordingly. Uh, but I think it's also an aspect that we should remember. Anything else? No, I think you probably get the message that we're cautious and concerned and, um, and really do um, appreciate that you understand that and have worked with our team to um, to put those safeguards in place. We do very much appreciate it. And uh, and for the past you know, four weeks, Mike has asked me, so what are you working on? I said, alcohol licensing, alcohol licensing. <laughs> so we've been working very closely um, with, with staff, and it's been a really great collaboration. I know where their concerns, and I think we, through that collaboration, really developed a plan that best serves both us from a business standpoint and, and the Commonwealth and, and the MGC. I, I think we're aligned in making sure it's a really safe and and responsible experience, but that serves the underlying purpose of the project. I think I think it's also important to note. You know, we we did get a number of comments um, through MGC comments and a letter from the Mass Restaurant Association, again voicing various concerns. Um, you know, there there isn't this notion of when you finish drinking someplace else, go to MGM because they're the kind of wild wild west, and all the rules are thrown out the window. Um, you know, you guys are still held to the same compliance laws that everybody else in Massachusetts is. You carry the same liability that every I other bar and everybody either. else does. Um, so it's, it's, it's not that, you know, you guys don't take that role seriously and we won't take that role seriously. But, uh, you know, my opinion is this is still something new and we want to work with you, but obviously be cautious and thoughtful about how we enact it. It sounds like we're pretty much have a consensus that this is fine, and and um, but with the cautions that everybody's discussing, just a slightly different perspective. It's sort of unfortunate that Da Vinci Park. I know this is not your responsibility, but a part of that ambience, having that really nice park there, you know, if, especially if there are places to sit, I think it would be a natural wish for people. It's a natural place for the bid to have events. Um, and in the normal just course of, of, of wandering around, experiencing this outdoor space, it would be kind of unfortunate not to be able to take your glass of wine or your beer and go sit and chat. Um, or maybe you can work something out with the city, but it seems kind of unfortunate in a way to block that piece off. Well, that, that was my point about the fencing, by the way. The, because, but, but, I, but I understand that it's the back of the, right. of the, back of the armory. Um, Okay, so we shall we move on then? Um, so we clearly have a consensus, I think, on this one. Should we move on to the two hours? Yeah. Should we take a quick break before we do that? Sure. I think I think we are ready to reconvene our meeting. And we are back on item number four with uh, Director Connolly. Uh, right, and when we left off, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe uh, the intent was to transition to discussing the 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. Right. Uh, aspect of uh, the gaming beverage license. Correct. So just as a, as a refresher, um, MGM Springfield is requesting uh, that they be allowed to serve alcohol on the gaming floor between the hours of 2 and 4 a.m., um, that is newly allowed um, on it based on a, uh, an amendment uh, that was signed by Governor Baker, I believe, last July. I was surprised when I looked back. It's almost been a year. Um, to uh, importantly, alcohol service uh, between two and four is only allowed on the gaming floor because uh, a patron must be actively engaged. And this is by statute: actively engaged in gaming in order um, to be served. So, um, 
so uh, they are requesting those hours for the gaming floor. Um, and they do, and I'll turn it over to Seth, if you don't mind, to, to speak to the plan as to how they will kind of do that reduction from the overall licensed area to just the gaming floor and how they'll maintain um, security and integrity of the, of the gaming floor and alcohol service during that time. If, if I could, I mean, I, at the last meeting, I believe we walked through the specifics of, of the plan and we're happy to revisit any piece, but what I, what I like to do is um, update you on some of what we've done since, um, because I think there was a desire by the commission to hear public comments. I know you received some. Uh, we did some work on our end uh, where we spoke with a couple of different stakeholder groups, um, in particular, uh, the City of Springfield, both uh, the Casino Oversight Committee of the City Council, as well as the Mayor, uh, and we did, um, we met with them, walked through the plan, much like we did with the Commission uh, several weeks ago, and then took them on site and showed them the limited um, uh, uh, bar bars that will be, essentially there will be no bars open, but the limited ability to have a drink and where you could have it uh, between 2 and 4 a.m., and how that's um, segregated. Uh, and controlled, and um, we got really positive feedback. Uh, in fact, um, anecdotally, but uh, based on a conversation with uh, the chair of the um, uh, City Council Casino Oversight, who was originally opposed and had drafted an opposition letter after meeting with us and seeing it on site, uh, changed his mind and I believe submitted a comment letter to the commission uh, supportive of this, um, of this um, 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. service. Uh, the mayor as well. Um, was impressed with um, our approach, uh, how it's narrowly tailored, and felt that it was important for our success, and I believe has also been uh, supportive uh, in, through a written submission. Uh, we also met, um, we convened two meetings with um, local law enforcement where we invited all surrounding community law enforcement. Uh, not every uh, community was, a, was uh, able to attend, uh, but we had two meetings that included um, members of law enforcement from not only the city of Springfield, but East Long Meadow, Long Meadow, uh, Chicopee, I believe those are the three, um, and uh, walked through the plan, uh, answered, uh, had questions and answers, and um, no real concerns were expressed um, uh, from any, any of those groups, and they appreciated uh, the information. Uh, finally, Has, we, there's been no formal position taken by any of the other agencies. They didn't, they didn't formally say yes or formally say no. That's correct. But that's in well, the state groups have weighed in. State law enforcement came out in opposition to this. Okay. So yeah, I was talking the about the unions yeah. have, have come out. It was the, the organizations, yes. Yeah. So uh, to be, and I don't, uh, originally when the law was passed, not in, re, not in response to our plan, correct? Uh, I, I, that's accurate. Okay. That was, in general, uh, before the specifics of your plan were, were made. Sure public. Uh, and then the final group we spoke to, we actually met with some of the local proprietors of, of um, some of the more popular um, bars and restaurants uh, that are neighbors of ours um, in the downtown, um, and we c convened some meetings to walk them through our plan, um, took them on site, uh, gave them the opportunity to ask questions, uh, which they very much appreciated, and expressed um, no concerns with, from a competitive standpoint with us um, being able to have this narrow uh, exception. Uh, I believe uh, it was my understanding that one, one or two of them may have submitted written comments. I don't know whether they ended up doing that, but we had really productive discussions with, with those um, local proprietors as well um, to ensure that they didn't feel, weren't surprised and didn't feel like it would be unfairly competitive. Um, so um, Unless you have, uh, unless you'd like me to, I, I do think we walked through it previously. I'm happy to go through it again, or if there are specific questions on, how, on the plan and how we would um, uh, shift from regular service to two to four a.m. Um, our folks here would be happy to address that. Um, I think I think your plan is solid, but like any plan, it's the implementation that's really important here. So I, I guess my questions um, were about the word getting out and how you intend to, um, to get that word out, and, and part of it is not just what you say but what you do, um, those individuals who are in neighboring um, communities who may say, okay, 
Bar is closing here. It's 1 o'clock. Let's go to MGM so we can continue drinking. That's a real concern. Um, it, was a, it was a big concern in, 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 the, in the Plainville with all of the chiefs there, the Plainville area. Um, and, and just how you intend to, um, I know I think more importantly than for the plaza, but for, um, for this extended drinking period, this idea of um, over intoxication, your techniques for slowing down, and your initial interaction with folks into entering the building will be critical um, for public safety. So I just wanted to hear a little more about uh, that piece. Sure, I, I think in terms of the kind of get the word out, I, I, we're not going to affirmatively, um, we're certainly not going to affirmatively advertise, um, hey, one of the great things about MGM Springfield is you can come drink until 4 a.m. Um, we, uh, what we've said is we're going to be very clear that um, you know, our, our bars are uh, closed at the same time as other bars in the community close. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, we, we don't plan on having, um, at this point, um, an affirmative kind of public education program around that. I think it's going to be um, gaming customers will, when they come, they'll, they'll understand that, um, oh, I, so long as I'm gaming, I can continue to um, consume alcoholic beverages until 4 a.m. Um, uh, so it'll be more of a, through word of mouth, and I think at the, at the same time, and I, I'd like to pass it to Jason to mm -hmm. address the latter part of the question, but the, the education in the community around this is not a place to come um, and continue the party uh, after bars mm -hmm. close will be through word of mouth and experience when, when those folks first try to come here for that purpose and realize that's not, um, that's not what we're engaged in. So maybe if you could speak to that a little bit, Jason. So one of the best things about our property is the, the open nature of it being able to enter basically from any side around around the property. After midnight, we close down eight of our 11 entrances and only have three left available. So we're looking at the hotel entrance, the plaza entrance, and the valet slash um, self-parking entrance. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot easier for us to screen, to size up, and to speak to all the individuals that are coming on property at that time. So we get a lot better sizing up of each person coming through to verify why they're here. And if they tell us, I just got down with my other bar, I want to come here to party, we're going to ask them to, to go home and come back another day. So your security will be specifically trained to be aware of this issue, this concern. This is in your read, reading comments. Comment after comment was, was really about um, the continuation of the ability to, to become intoxicated and then get on the roadways. Correct. Um, so, so your security will be um, specifically trained on this issue and, and be looking for those individuals who may be coming to continue their drinking and, and being advised that um, this is just an opportunity for those who are here to, to game. That's correct. Mm -hmm. okay. What about... Um, I'm sorry, so on the other side, the people that are wrapping up and leaving the premises via vehicle? I mean, so that you're going to check people and gauge them on the way in. What about the process on the way out? Because there were some concerns raised, particularly 4 a.m. departure time coinciding with people going to work. Very similar exit process as well. Of course, when they leave the food and beverage establishment or wherever they were drinking, they're, they're going to do their size up process on the way out. And if there's an issue, notify security again. And then if we see them going out the door, we'll engage them, hey, have a good night. And then if at that point we, we see there's an issue, like how about a ride share? How about another way home? Can you call a friend? Do you have a designated driver? Or if they just blow us off, we have the GEU on site that they can intervene right then and there and, and assist us on that. And I think that's a really important point. While we take you know, responsibility for and, and really engaging in that process, I think that's where the partnership with the Game Enforcement Unit on site is going to be really critical. I mean, there are very few places where patrons are going to be consuming alcohol and literally to walk out the door to their car, they're going to have to walk by a trooper. Um, that's going to be a, a, a disincentive and a significant, I think, um, uh, tool that we have that's going to discourage um, uh, intoxicated driving um, because we will have law enforcement um, right there on site and we can work very closely with with um, the Game Enforcement Unit to ensure that um, that um, there's safe safe conduct mm -hmm. going on, especially at that hour. Mm -hmm. um, is, is there anything that you've um, analyzed or projected relative to um, 
who who might be those patrons at, at those hours more likely to be whether staying at a hotel or another a nearby hotel um, the, the, the no the uh, no length. formal analysis but I think maybe Anthony if you could uh, Anthony's been um, operating casinos for for quite some time and if you could speak to generally um, that the customers at that hour and especially the, those gaming um, who would be eligible for for um, extended service. Yeah, typically the people gaming at this type of hour would be a convention guest um, who are usually staying in a hotel, either our hotel or they would be in a local hotel. Typical locals technically typically don't stay that late. I mean, Springfield naturally shuts down at 9 p.m. as it is. Um, I think they're used to shutting down at 2 a.m. because that's when the, all the bars close. So I think typically it'd be your convention guest or hotel guest because they usually have fun, have a great time, and then go to their room or jump in a ride share and, and go back to the Sheridan, which is right down the street. Mm -hmm. That's what we're anticipating, and I've anticipated over the last 19 years um, mm -hmm. working in Mississippi, Las Vegas markets. Did you see some of the shift workers also? I know in Atlantic City, the group of individuals that work till midnight and it could be nurses, you know, all kinds of uh, shift workers that would not even come in until, say, 1 o'clock and, and like, like the fact that they had the opportunity to, um, to game or to, and, and to have a cocktail in those hours where there's typically nothing going on. I know that was, uh, you know, some, somewhat of a uh, phenomenon is the shift workers coming in late. Yeah, typ typically in the markets I've worked, I haven't seen a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, because we're a more of a resort, mm -hmm. we charge a premium at price. And yeah. late night, our table games, it's, you know, our, our, our limits are usually a little bit elevated. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I typically haven't seen that. I know maybe in Atlantic City it was a little bit more in tune, but here, I mean, I, I don't envision that. Right. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see it being. Mm -hmm. and, and another thing is our employees aren't gonna be allowed to come in. We have certain restrictions on, um, so my employees in food and beverage, right. they're not going to be allowed back on property to right. enjoy until right. two hours after their shift, mm -hmm. which by then the shift will be over, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. service will be over. Okay. Since, since you mentioned, um, when would you, have you determined whether or at what time might you uh, lower the limits on, on, bed, on beds? At what point in, 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 the, in the evening or? Uh, and if it's a trade secret, you can tell me later. It, I doubt it, that it is. We'll People go with that, but out. it could be that none of us here know. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, there, there are folks in the company that would be able to speak to that better. I, I think it's really contextual. It's, um, with the technology, it's, it's less of an issue to make those changes because it's all digital with, with our visual limits. So I think it'll depend on day of the week, seasonal, who's in town. If a, if a large convention is town and it's, it's really, it's really um, supply and demand, we're really just trying to manage capacity on the tables. And if we can, um, if we can justify a, a rate increase, um, mm -hmm. you know, we'll do that just to, you know, sort of thin out the crowd a little bit. So I think right. case by case, Emily. Yep. Good. I know that um, in, when I read the reports from PPC that there are times when somebody's inebriated and somebody arranges for a ride home, either it's security, your PPC security, or our GEU folks. Is that, who runs that program? Is that a formal program, and who does that? Lisa, you're nodding, or maybe Bruce, or maybe somebody who knows? But it's just sort of an informal, if somebody needs it, it's not a, you don't have a standing deal with Uber or something to be on call or anything. I think having, having, having some such capacity in place, maybe even being willing to pay for the ride, you know, um, would be an, another nice kind of assurance. Um, we, C Commissioner Zuniga and I, mm -hmm. were at a meeting um, with Lindsay Tucker, who is the Associate Commissioner of the Department of Public Health, 
and uh, the co-chair of the Public Health Trust Fund Executive Committee along with Commissioner Zuniga. And um, she brought up a, the, what was somewhat her, but also implied Department of Public Health position on this. And Commissioner Zuniga asked her if there was any, she was predisposed against it, as you might imagine. Um, but she, she, in answer to Commissioner Zuniga's question, said yes, there was data on this that she thought would be helpful, or at least we thought would be helpful, and we asked her to send it. And um, we've all had a chance to look at it, but some of it was quite lengthy, and I asked Commissioner Zuniga if he would um, be willing to speak to mm -hmm. what she sent, yep. um, so everybody gets a complete. I'd be more than happy to, and, and uh, please tell me if I'm going into too much detail, but um, uh, there was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of links and attachments in the email that, uh, that she forwarded. Uh, I uh, included, I asked the staff to include what I thought was the most uh, relevant, and I'll speak to them um, as much as I can in a summary level. Um, one of the attachments that they sent was a study um, by somebody named Han and others about uh, the increasing hours of sale. It was a study of studies, essentially, and that's, uh, they were looking at studies throughout the world, really, um, that uh, looked at uh, when jurisdictions increased the hours of sale um, at, at different times. Um, what's very uh, relevant and different from what we're considering here is countries or jurisdictions that increased hours throughout the country, um, which is not what's happening in, 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 in my opinion at this, at, in, in here. There's a very specific and narrow question for us, um, but I'll speak to it very uh, general, uh, generally um, because I think it's also, it's also important. There were obviously some um, uh, harms that came on these, some of these studies around the world or increasing hours in serving for more than two hours. And there were inconclusive harms or uh, effects when the increase was for two hours or less, which I find very um, uh, just serendipitous, uh, really, because the, what we're considering here is the two-hour uh, mark um, or two-hour increase. Uh, nonetheless, uh, these, uh, as I mentioned before, these increases were throughout um, uh, entire jurisdictions, and it occurred to me when I was reading this uh, uh, um, study of studies that that would be relevant if, the, if, say, the legislature was thinking about increasing hours throughout the state as opposed to um, just at the casino floor. There, um, there's another study that I also included in the packet which I thought was most interesting. Uh, it's from the Journal of Health Economics. Um, and they looked at um, the, the, when, when, when a casino is introduced um, in a jurisdiction, uh, they tracked what's called ARFA, or alcohol-related fatalities. Um, and the authors were able to ascertain that ARFAs go down, actually, ARFAs go up. Fatalities go fatalities up. Fatalities go up uh, when a casino is introduced, but only on rural counties. Um, they actually go down on populous counties, which I think it was just not what um, what they intend, what the DPH intended uh, when they were submitting their comments. Um, at least, uh, uh, and, and they, they have very much um, um, an example that is very relevant um, in that study, and that is uh, in Milwaukee, um, uh, the, the Milwaukee County. Uh, population 936,000 uh, versus Sauk County, Wisconsin, County, Wisconsin population 17,000. Um, ARFAs went up in the rural yeah. county. Fatalities went down, went 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 up, uh, but they actually went down uh, in uh, in Milwaukee County. Again, it's a counterintuitive um, uh, result. Uh, the 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 authors. Uh, hypothesized that um, in rural counties, uh, people drive longer for more hours or more, more miles um, while intoxicated, and that, 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 that makes fatalities go up. Uh, but there's a substitution effect, they theorize, when they go, when we analyze the um, populous counties, 
in which people are doing something else uh, when a casino comes in, as opposed to just, uh, just drinking. Now, what's interesting uh, here is not only that in, a counterintuitive result, but um, the fact that um, at least in very rough numbers, Hamden County is a medium-sized county. It's not rural, uh, but it's not at least as populous as the example in the study of, that I mentioned earlier of Milwaukee County. So um, I, I, I don't know how that cuts, except that it's, it's seemingly in the middle. I actually asked that question of the people from BSAS, uh, the Bureau of Substance Abuse, uh, who, who initially forwarded this, um, this study. Um, the other, those, those were the main, um, obviously this might not, Middlesex County is much more populous than, um, than uh, it's maybe two million people, um, and, but we're not considering that at this point. I can answer any questions if anybody has. Um, no, I, thank you. That, if that I could good. add one point that's somewhat relevant um, that I think might be of interest to the commission, and Anthony could speak to this, but um, on the substitution effect, one thing that's unique about casinos um, versus, say, other establish establishments where you can consume alcohol at the same time is we're generally giving the alcohol away. And what that means is that we're controlling much more carefully how much and how frequently you're getting it because we're spending millions and millions of dollars in giving this away versus an establishment that's selling it and is incentivized to the frequency and the volume to increase. And what, what is the, if it's okay disclosing, how much, how much money do you spend in? Um, uh, oh, it, it's million, tens of millions of dollars in, in hard cost that gets charged back to the casino. But, but we also, you know, typically in a bar, it's an ounce and a half pour. On the casino floor, it's seven-eighths of an ounce. So you have to have multiple drinks to even equal to one drink at a, of a typical retail establishment. And what's the typical round time that, that you... So typically, it's a 20-minute it's a round time. On a graveyard shift with a limited staff, um, it actually goes to closer to a 30-minute round time. You know, I... I, I um... You reminded me of uh, another main point that I wanted to mention around the first study of studies, and that is that the authors also point out very importantly that the effects of regulation in those expansions was, was not analyzed in those studies, um, which I think is the most relevant piece that we were considering here, because in countries where they expanded um, the hours, um, um, it, was, it was throughout, but people already had those licensures or those licenses and, uh, and have the incentives that you allude to uh, to sell more and faster. Um, we have the ability, as, as Commissioner Stebbins was saying earlier, to limit, condition, look at however many, um, for, for however many uh, days, let's say, or a period of time, and see how it, what happens what kind of uh, person is um, engaging in, in, <coughs> in, in both gambling and drinking at that, what kind of customer at that time, what's the volume. Uh, um, we've had some of the comments as to, you know, the, the notion that there will be a, a, an inflow of people or an outflow of people at that time. I find hard to substantiate just on the logic that, you know, there's extended hours. So um, it, it's another point that I wanted to make. Thank you. That was really helpful. Other questions, thoughts? Just a, just a quick question, because obviously during this two to four time frame, you're only serving people who are actively gaming. Uh, do your uh, table game dealers go through any type of training to also identify somebody who's sitting right across from them might be intoxicated or overserved? Yeah, typically a, ta a table game dealer will notify the cocktail waitress because there could be a shift change, it could be a break, so it's a, it could be a new person coming on that hasn't served them yet. So typically the dealers are the first to identify. They actually identify with the pit boss. The pit boss will then notify the beverage manager who does make that assumption, and then we move to the security cutoff point if that happens. And they are all going to be going through a game sense training, right? That's all your correct. employees. That's, That's correct. correct. 
Seth, I had a question that, in a way, is probably in, was more relevant when this was in the legislature than now. But um, what's the what's the argument? Why is it? Why does it make sense to to single out people who are gaming for the ability to drink for another couple hours, as opposed to watching a West Coast baseball game or being in a late night movie theater? What's the argument? on which this notion was sold uh, I can't I can't speak to the I can't speak to the argument uh, on which it was sold um, because we weren't selling it but um, I think the what I can speak to is that it's an industry issue um, you heard from from us uh, before that um, Detroit is the only other property um, in our entire portfolio that does not have 24 uh, 7 alcohol service and so um, folks are used to going to casinos um, throughout the country and having an experience where they can game and consume alcohol um, without without a cutoff hour, and so it's really a um, it's really a competitive um, it's industry competition. It's ensuring consistent experience through as much as we can throughout um, industry properties, and so I think it's um, it's not that a someone gaming is any. There's something about the experience that's any that's uh, different from watching a game where um, where you'd like to have someone drinking. It's just um, um, where the jurisdictions that that started gaming, it's always been uh, um, gone hand in hand with extended service and to to stay competitive and to deliver the experience that our um, our customers um, expect. We want to be as competitive as possible. And remind me, it, Connecticut does not right. Connecticut stops at two. Remind me of the other juris nearby jurisdictions. That's, that's my understanding that Connecticut currently um, stops at two. And Rhode that's Island? Uh, I don't. Does anybody know? I don't know Rhode Island. Do you know, Lisa? Two. two. OK, other, other thoughts? Um, we probably ought to take this one as a separate matter. Um, so does someone want to present a motion on the issue? Go ahead. The, the only other thing I think um, Commissioner Stebbins had a thought about um, either given whether it's myself or Director Conley or both of us, just right. sort of this emergency authority um, as, as a condition to whatever you decide. And I would just suggest that that emergency authority would then, you know, require us to come back at the next public meeting and obviously report whatever we did. Mm -hmm. Let's let, let if I can be so presumptuous, Commissioner Stevens. I, I think you made two suggestions. One was that we give the executive director the authority to intervene on any of the approval that we give here um, on a real-time basis, and then to report. And then the second was that there be some quite rigorous, for the sake of discussion, three months out. Um, quite rigorous analysis of the consequences of these decisions. Um, so let's say on the two to four issue that those two things are preconditions. If we're if we do go forward on the on the two to four issue, that it would have those two preconditions. Is that okay with everybody? Did I characterize that accurately? Please? Yeah, I mean, the two to four is part of the gaming alcohol license. My suggestion or, or conditions on the license would extend to the full. To every casino license. Okay. But since we're going to separate, we're going to vote on the two to four separately. It would it, it would be covered under your two broader um, amend, amend, or conditions. Yes. Okay. Do somebody want to mo have a motion on the two to four issue? Well, I can I can take a position uh, if, <laughs> right. if that's uh, if that's helpful for the discussion. I I'm willing to go along with 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 the request. Um, with those uh, with those conditions, I'll mention that um, something that I updated you all uh, uh, in a prior meeting, uh, which I would think would operate here very much, and that is the amount of uh, and commitment that your company is making towards the Game Sense program, which includes having discussions, um, empowering your employees to have discussions around um, gambling for a long time. Um, which I would put same here, you know, engaging in a lot of alcohol uh, uh, while gaming uh, for a long time. Uh, what I've seen of, of your colleagues, notably in Alan Feldman, 
um, is uh, this, this real commitment and empowerment that I find is, is very helpful in this, this um, discussion. Um, in, there's, there's, there's powerful incentives for those employees to have those discussions, and I would be looking for those kinds of um, uh, signs and evidence in, 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 in our own uh, uh, property here um, as, as we continue with, uh, with, with these conditions. But that's, that's my predisposition. Uh, Okay, well, let's, go, we, let's just do it by predisposition. Um, yeah, I, I'd be inclined to, um, to allow this with the commitment. I mean, my issue really is public safety. And, and uh, I, I really um, was looking for, and I think I heard a commitment to, um, to pay attention to this issue, which means, you know, the training of, of um, staff, uh, collaborative working environment with uh, the gaming enforcement unit, the, which includes you know, our gaming, gaming agents, as well as the uh, security staff. So I think with, um, with all of these safeguards in place and, and the commitment, um, I'm, uh, I'm inclined. And again, I do like the, uh, the idea of giving our executive director um, immediate authority and, and the and the um, three-month rigorous, let's make sure um, that we're not uh, having a problem with public safety. Uh, Commissioner Cameron, if I, if I can, I, to the extent it wasn't clear, and part of the reason I'm here is because it's a very serious topic, and you absolutely have our commitment. I would, I would if, you, if not required, I would, I would ask to come back after 90 days and collectively give a, give a report card on how we did. And it's not just our job, I, we're gonna rely on on your team as well mm -hmm. to help us with these yes. um, difficult issues mm -hmm. and as I would welcome you to keep us on a short leash that's mm -hmm. how I've envisioned keeping the team on a short leash because we view this very seriously and I've, I've got to answer to folks within the company if, if we do not manage this well mm -hmm. great thank you thank you I do not in any way question the commitment of MGM in this regard or in anything you've come in front of us so far but I have to say on balance the public safety concerns and the concerns about people gaming into the night and having continued alcohol access. On balance, I am just not convinced that at this point, the Commonwealth, um, it's in the best interest of the Commonwealth to extend from two to four. I, I would not be in favor of the extension. Commissioner Stebbins? Um, I'm like my colleagues. I mean, you know, the, the comments and questions that were raised to us are around the issues of public safety. Um, I applaud the fact that you did reach out um, to the, you know, not only the host community, but the surrounding community. Uh, I'm disappointed that uh, you didn't get 100% participation or engagement. Um, you know, that said, um, uh, I, I do have a level of comfort in terms of the procedures and the training that you're willing to provide and offer. Uh, however, um, you know, I think, you know, the conditions I want to recommend will uh, uh, might quickly end that if, if, uh, if this does not go off well, because I think we're, we're kind of both on the hook to make sure this succeeds. So uh, I'm, I'm predisposed to, um, to support the 2 to 4 um, a.m. Uh, service continuation. That is a majority. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a 51. 49 on this, um, I, if, originally I would have thought, but this is a crazy idea, and frankly, I think it's very peculiar that the legislature chose to single out this particular cohort as being able to drink for an extra two hours. I mean, if there's any, if there's any cohort you were gonna single out, this would have been the last one I would have thought you would have singled out, that is people who are, who are gambling. Um, I have, on the other hand, which I think, I, I think the end of this paragraph, I'm gonna, the, gonna be, the, this is the 51, that um, I've learned in my years here that a casino is a very stupid place to be a criminal and is probably the safest place to drink in Massachusetts. You know, it's more regulated and more attended to and more trackable um, than probably any place there possibly is. Uh, um, so I think at the very end of the day, I, I very marginally would go along with this as I sort of would tend to any time give people more freedom to do what they want in a properly supervised environment. So I guess that means we have about a four to one 
on uh, so I think we could lump it all into one we have that issue is, is clearly a consensus um, a majority so maybe we could lump it into a single motion to adopt the um, the plan with with the attendant um, conditions so is, is this I just want to be clear are you not talking about voting on the full license with the, the caveat that you've just discussed on the 2 to 4 a.m. The full, right, the yeah. full license as presented with that is with the outdoor schema and with the extension and drinking hours with the conditions that you've already s established plus the two conditions that Commissioner Stevens And said. if I could just ask for one more condition, sure. which is I think I discussed it a little bit on the outdoor plaza, I'd just like staff to have the ability, maybe through me, to do one final walkthrough before the property opens, make sure the gaming agents, state police, ABCC are all fine with the eventual plan as it ends up because I the scheme the the diagram looks fine but they're working hard and I want to make sure whatever it is matches whatever the Commission's expectations are so that would just be one additional item everybody I think okay. that's appropriate to yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay with that. Um, all right well Commissioner Stevens do you want to articulate a motion uh, sure uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd move that the Commission approve the uh, gaming alcohol license for MGM Springfield as provided in the packet uh, with consideration of the conditions already presented to us by Director Connolly. Uh, in addition, the following um, conditions, uh, one, that this Commission review the alcohol license uh, 90 days after the opening of MGM Springfield. Uh, that we afford the uh, executive director the opportunity to review the outdoor service uh, plan uh, with commission staff and our licensee prior to opening and that uh, this commission authorize the executive director to suspend any portion of the license or modify any staffing or procedures uh, of the license for compliance and report uh, back to the full commission at the next uh, uh, convenient meeting. Well said. Second? Second. Is there further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye, but for the two four. Okay. okay. Well, we, we didn't give you a choice, but so you're, <laughs> I guess so you're, you're at nay on this one, right? <laughs> Um, so that motion passes four to one to four and a half to a half. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you. Seth can get back to work. Right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just in terms of process, um, we have uh, item 5A, which has some guests who have traveled, the GLPI legal issues, um, and then the rest, I think, are, are mainly internal. Um, it feels like you uh, probably will want to get something to eat at some point, but uh, potentially if we could hang in there and do the, the one issue with our guests, we mm -hmm. could uh, let yeah. them make whatever afternoon travel plans they have and then get something to eat and clean up afterwards. Yeah, I mean, I do, we maybe could just go on through because I think the other things are pretty, pretty let's do this, If let's you want to do that, let, let's, let's do the sure. PI and then we'll talk about whether. See what time they, it is. Yeah. See what time it is, yeah. All right, so the, we'll welcome the folks from GLPI and attendant lawyers and what have you. Attorney Grossman. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Good afternoon. Um, we're here before you on the uh, transfer of interest uh, matter involving GLPI and Penn National Gaming. There is a letter in your packet that's been submitted by the parties outlining the issue. Uh, and as it uh, mentions, today we're here on a very narrow issue. But uh, just to kind of tee things up, and then I'll turn it over. Uh, to the petitioners to introduce the whole lineup and uh, run through the issues. I thought I would give you a, a brief overview of what we're here for today and the transfer of interest uh, uh, process in general. 
we can obviously uh, move quickly through any parts that um, aren't entirely uh, useful at the moment. But uh, just to kick things off, I would just mention that the, the commission, as you know, has been notified that there is a proposed transaction uh, in which the premises of the gaming establishment comprising Plain Ridge Park Casino, owned by Plain Ridge Gaming and Redevelopment LLC, which is our gaming licensee, and a subsidiary of Penn National Gaming, will be transferred to an entity owned by Gaming and Leisure Properties Incorporated, which is known as GLPI. GLPI is a publicly traded REIT. And the parties, of course, are here today to more fully explain any details of the transaction itself. Chapter 23K expressly allows for transfers of interest and it discusses it in a number of areas. The commission has crafted regulations um, which uh, more fully set out the regulatory framework uh, for which a transfer of interest is processed by us. That's in sections 116.08 through 116.10. In essence, the process is really designed to do two things. It's first designed to ensure that the commission has an opportunity to determine whether the transfer will result in any new qualifiers um, and ensure that they are able to go through the RFA1 suitability process to give the commission and the IEB time to conduct a, an investigation and ultimately for the commission to determine the suitability of any new qualifiers. And secondly, uh, it's designed to determine whether the transfer will result in any change of control over the gaming license, such that the quality of the operation or any agreements, host and surrounding community or otherwise will be affected in any way by the transfer. Today we're here on the request of the parties uh, to make two initial legal determinations um, in advance of the uh, decision that will be upcoming before you in approximately a month uh, that has to do deal with the interim authorization of the deal that will be presented to you. So we'll go through the deal in much more detail in about a month, but uh, we're here on just these two preliminary matters. The first preliminary matter pertains to the terms of the lease that will result uh, from the transaction, and the second pertains to the uh, certain terms of the trust agreement. And I don't want to steal their thunder, so I'm not going to get into uh, the particulars, but they will explain to you uh, exactly what they are. As a general matter, I can represent to you that the legal department supports, um, and I believe the IEB as well, supports uh, the proposal and the, the legal interpretations that will be forwarded to you here today by the petitioners. Uh, and before we turn things over, I thought it might be helpful just to quickly run through the law of transfers of interest, if that would be helpful. Uh, we'll obviously need to go through it in a little more detail uh, before the next hearing. But just to help calibrate where we are in the process here today, I can just run through some of the particulars uh, that govern transfers of interest. And they provide essentially as follows, that no person can transfer a gaming license or a gaming establishment or any associated structure, real property, uh, premises, or facility without notification to the IEB and subsequent approval uh, by a majority of the commission. The commission must require that anyone with a financial interest in a gaming establishment be qualified for licensure by meeting the criteria that's outlined in sections 12 and 16 of chapter 23K. The transfer is also subject to uh, commission regulation section 129.01, which essentially looks at whether the transfer will result in any change of control over the gaming licensee. Uh, uh, gaming license. And if there is such a change, the transferee is essentially required to agree to assume all of the existing obligations. For the Category 2 licensee, there is a, a law in place that says that there can be no transfer of the gaming license for the first five years from the date of issuance unless there are certain enumerated circumstances in play. That's not the case here. The gaming license is not being transferred, just the gaming establishment. Uh, a change of control itself, and this is a determination the Commission will be called upon to make eventually, uh, is defined in the regulation to mean a transfer of interest which directly or indirectly results in a person obtaining greater than 50% ownership in a gaming licensee or which results in or is likely to result in significant change to the management or operation of a gaming license. 
For what it's worth, the present situation does not appear to involve any such change of control. This appears to be a straight real estate type transaction. Whenever a person contracts to transfer any property relating to an ongoing gaming establishment, as opposed to an open market transfer, under circumstances which require that the transferee be deemed suitable, as is the case in this particular situation, the contract shall not specify a closing or settlement date which is earlier than 121 days after the submission of a completed RFA-1 application. This provision is in place to allow the IEB and the Commission adequate time to investigate, at least on a preliminary basis, the suitability and overall suitability of the transaction and the transferee. The RFA-1 application is required to uh, be accompanied by a fully executed and approved trust agreement. And that's one of the issues that we're here for today, to have a look at the trust agreement. The trust is a vehicle that is designed to effectuate a clean separation of a transferee that is ultimately possibly deemed unsuitable uh, from any interest in the gaming license or in a gaming establishment if that scenario should arise. That's why we have the trust. The commission uh, is required to hold a hearing and render a decision on what is referred to as interim authorization. That's the next step in the process after today. Um, if the commission grants interim authorization, the closing or settlement of the deal may occur. Uh, the interim authorization process was included uh, in the process in recognition that the full suitability investigation may take some time to fully complete. So as not to keep the whole transaction in a holding pattern, this process, this interim authorization process, is designed to allow the deal to close with essentially only a preliminary finding of suitability um, and a finding of the overall assessment of the transaction having been uh, completed. The, once that is allowed, if it is allowed, the commission may at any time after uh, that order all interests subject to the transaction to be moved into the trust. If there exists reasonable cause to believe that the proposed transferee may be found unsuitable. If a prospective transferee fails or refuses to transfer a property into the trust, they will be deemed to be unsuitable. When it comes to the ultimate decision, there are just a couple of uh, quick principles that I would throw out there just uh, to provide a full understanding of this, these transfers of interest. And they are that the commission may place any additional uh, conditions or restrictions on a transfer that the commission deems uh, suitable. The commission shall reject a gaming license transfer or transfer of interest in the gaming establishment to any unsuitable person. The Commission shall not approve of any transfer that would result in the transferee having a financial interest in more than one gaming license issued by the Commission. The Commission may reject a transfer if the Commission considers the transfer unsuitable. And alternatively stated and finally, the Commission may reject any proposed transfer that in the opinion of the Commission would be disadvantageous to the interests of the Commonwealth. And we define disadvantageous to the interest to include such things as not meeting the suitability standards, not uh, complying with any particular law or regulation uh, that uh, is overseen by the commission, and that they don't meet uh, section 121.09 relative to the change of control. So that's essentially an abridged version of the rules that govern the transfer of interest in the process. As you can see, we're just in advance of the interim authorization, which again will be coming back before you in about a month's time. Uh, Ms. Lilios, uh, Ms. Blue, and I are all available to take any questions as this progresses. Uh, at the moment, I though, if there are no questions, I thought I'd just turn it over to uh, Attorney Albano, who represents the parties, and he can certainly introduce the team and then walk you through the proposal. I can just uh, jump in by way of introduction. Um, uh, that we have uh, Chris Rogers, uh, that I think uh, many of you have, uh, not all of you have met before. He's Vice President and Deputy General Counsel for Penn National, uh, and with him is Brandon Moore, Senior VP, General Counsel and Secretary for GLPI. Traveling with them today is Melissa Ferullo, who is the Director of Licensing and Legal Affairs for GLPI, uh, and of course, Mr. Albano, uh, Local Counsel. Uh, for both parties uh, for purposes of this transaction. Good 
Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Good morning. morning. My name is John Albano. Good afternoon. Is it afternoon? Afternoon, sorry. <laughs> um, first, I, I, on behalf of both of the applicants, all of the applicants, I wanted to thank the Commission for taking the time to address these two specific issues uh, relating to the proposed transfer. It's greatly appreciated that you've made the time uh, to hear us on that. Um, as, as Mr. Grossman um, explained, the two specific issues are first, under the proposed transaction, the property will be sold to a subsidiary of GLPI and then will be leased back to the licensee. The first issue is how long does that lease have to be as a matter of law under Chapter 23K? That's the first issue I'd address. The, the second issue, as Mr. Grossman uh, mentioned, is related to the terms of the trust that are required under the interim authorization um, uh, regulations, which, as he explained, are meant to ensure that if a, for lack of a better term, problem arises, there can be a clear separation between the transferee and the uh, control of the real estate or, in other instances, the license. And, and we believe, as I'll explain, that the trust we have proposed does effectively address both the letter and spirit of those uh, regulations. I, I did think, we thought together, actually, that um, subject to the Commission's desires, of course, that because this is the first time we've come before you on this, and because we're going to be addressing two pretty specific issues, that it might be helpful, and in fact it might avoid you feeling frustrated during my presentation of these two issues, if you heard a bit about the overall transaction and had an opportunity to ask any questions about that, um, just from sort of a very high level, understanding that we will be back to you know, drill down in as much detail as anyone desires in just a, a matter of weeks. If, if that would be helpful, then what I'd propose is that I turn it over to first to Mr. Rogers mm -hmm. and then uh, to, to Mr. Moore for uh, that overview. That's a good Sounds good to me. I, yes, at, at, a high level. at a high level. At a high level, level. Say, okay. yes. Very well, thank you. Um, my name is Chris Rogers. I'm the Deputy General Counsel at Penn National. Um, so this all started about a year and a half ago when Penn received a letter from Pinnacle suggesting that the two companies combine. Um, upon receipt of that letter, we began a almost year-long process of negotiating with Pinnacle on a potential transaction and what would that look like. You might be curious why it took a year. Um, there was a couple of reasons. One, we had to agree on valuation and who would be the acquirer, and we ultimately settled that Penn would be the acquirer in the transaction, and we settled on a valuation that included not only a cash component for their stockholders, but also an equity component. And the rationale for that was, one, to, to permit Penn to reduce the amount of debt it would need in order to complete the financing but also to um, permit the Pinnacle shareholders to participate in the upside of the combined company through equity and the combined um, Penn entity. Um, the, other, the other reason why it took a while uh, to get the deal done is that we knew that there would be required divestitures in connection with the transaction. So in Ohio and in Indiana, there are statutory limits on the number of licenses, and we knew that we'd be required to divest of one in both of those jurisdictions. We also knew that um, both Penn and Pinnacle had strong presences in Kansas City and St. Louis. And although there was not a statutory limitation on the number of licenses, we knew that the FTC would be interested in that from an anti-competitive standpoint. And we decided um, at the outset that we would do some divestitures in those two markets as well. We contacted Boyd Gaming Corporation a very uh, well-regarded regional gaming operator who's been licensed in a number of different jurisdictions as our, as our preferred divestiture partner. And we agreed with them early that they would buy the operations of four of the casinos currently operated by Pinnacle, 
one in Kansas City, one in St. Louis, one in Indiana, and one in Ohio. So that brings us to how GLPI gets into the story. So GLPI is a REIT that was spun off from Penn in 2013. And in connection with that spinoff, Penn contributed um, the real estate for substantially all of its, uh, all of its properties to GLPI and entered into a long-term master lease with GLPI, pursuant to which Penn leases those properties to conduct gaming operations. Since the spinoff, um, GLPI did its own um, transaction with Pinnacle, in which it acquired all of the real, substantially all the real estate from, from Pinnacle um, and entered into a separate lease with Pinnacle, which we call the Pinnacle Master Lease. Um, this, was all, with, this was all prior to the, to the merger discussions? Correct, correct. Um, so when Penn did the spinoff, we did not yet have the license for, for Plain Ridge. And so it was not included as part of what was given to GLPI, and Penn owned the real estate and has owned the real estate since opening. Um, so because we were required to do divestitures, the properties being divested were, were part of the Pinnacle master lease with GLPI. So they have one lease that covers multiple properties, and we would need to do an amendment to remove those properties out of the lease, and GLPI would enter into a new lease with Boyd Gaming with, re with respect to those four properties. So we started to talk to GLPI about how that would work and how we could do the amendment to the lease and, and the divestitures. And at that time, we came to the conclusion that we thought it made sense to, to add Plain Ridge Park into the Pinnacle Master Lease and sell the real estate to GLPI. Now, the advantage of doing that is that we received 250, or will receive $250 million of proceeds for the real estate that we can then use to fund the transaction with Pinnacle. So it allowed us to reduce the amount of debt we would otherwise incur in the transaction. So because of that, we ended up doing, agreeing to a transaction in December of, of last year that involved four publicly traded companies. So in addition to Penn and Pinnacle, it also involved Boyd and GLPI. And what was unique about this deal is that when it was announced, all four companies had their stock trade higher. I mean, it was uniformly applauded by, by the market um, and really was a win-win for everyone. For, for Penn, it really is a tremendous opportunity for us to increase our scale. Um, we were able to um, get access into new markets where we currently don't have a presence. And we're able to get um, some additional customers into our database that we think would allow us to more effectively compete with some of our competitors. <clears throat> So as for what it means to, to Massachusetts, um, the impact will be minimal from an operations standpoint. Penn will continue to be the operator. The real estate um, at, at Plain Ridge Park will be owned by GLPI and will be leased to Penn as part of a master lease that includes the other properties that are being acquired from Pinnacle. And the advantage from a Penn perspective is we think this transaction really does give us the size and scale to more effectively compete with the Caesars, the MGMs, the, the winds of the world, um, while also giving us a much stronger balance sheet with a company that has more geographic diversity and, and a, a larger cash flow. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Brandon to sort of explain a little bit more detail about GLPI. Good afternoon. I guess first, I'd like to thank you for delaying your lunch as a person who <laughs> values their lunch. I, I appreciate that. Um, second, I just want you to know, you know, we have a long way to go, but working with your staff has been fantastic. I mean, everybody here has been very helpful to us in these nuanced issues and helping us work through this, given um, the fact that we're new to, to this jurisdiction. We very much appreciate that. Um, this is a little bit odd because we haven't had an opportunity to tell you who we are and why we're involved too much before bringing in front of you a couple of very nuanced issues that impact our business. So I'll just take a couple of minutes and tell you a little bit about GLPI. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to get into more detail, but I think that probably will come at some subsequent hearings. But as Chris mentioned, you know, we're a publicly traded real estate investment trust. We started with the Penn properties. We purchased a casino uh, outside of St. Louis in Illinois shortly after the spin out. Um, and then we purchased the Pinnacle assets. After that, we purchased a casino outside of Pittsburgh. And we're currently under agreements not only with Penn to buy two additional casinos in this transaction, but we recently announced a transaction to buy 
the uh, real estate portfolio of Tropicana Entertainment. So we're working on that transaction as well. So, so we've broadened the scope, and since then there have been a couple of competitors come out. So since while we were the first um, gaming-focused REIT, uh, obviously Caesars re reorganized their business and, and, and came out, spun out of a bankruptcy, a REIT, and MGM did a similar transaction, although for much different reasons, where they have sort of a captively held um, but separate traded uh, a REIT. So, so the presence of REITs in gaming is becoming more prolific with each and every transaction that occurs in the gaming space. For us, um, we're a passive landlord, meaning that we don't get involved in the operations of our tenants. Our REITs are triple net REITs, meaning that the tenants are responsible for not only the property operation, but the maintenance, the insurance, the real estate taxes, the whole nine yards. So we are really not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of any of our tenants at these facilities, and they're all leased on a long-term basis. So for us, um, while we are involved in this up front and obviously in the transaction to acquire the real estate and to, and to contribute to Penn's deal in that way, after the transaction, we're not really involved in the property level day-to-day um, -day operations. I'll just say a little bit about the lease structure because I think that's important in the issues you're, you're focused on today. Our leases are generally 35-year leases. So the lease with Pinnacle that this property would be going into was put in place in 2016. So it's in year three of a, a total term of 35 years. Now it's structured so that it has a 10-year initial term and then five-year renewals. Those are all the option of the tenant. So we as the landlord, as long as the tenant is not in breach of the lease, don't have any right to kick our tenants out until the end, uh, and no incentive to, quite frankly. I mean, for us, um, our objective is to make sure that we always have tenants in our buildings. It, unlike any other REIT, uh, vacancies are bad for us. So if Penn were to agree to be there for, for 80 years, that would be great for us. <clears throat> there are accounting reasons why we don't have longer term leases um, and we don't need to get into that unless you'd like to but suffice to say that those leases become a different character more like a financing if you enter into a long term lease that includes the buildings and things like that so the 35 years wasn't any desire on behalf of the tenants or the landlord to kick anybody out at the end of 35 years it was more structured to ensure that these leases met certain requirements to be a true lease um, so th those are the terms. And at the end of the term, we have a very unique feature in our leases. So our, our struggle as a landlord in this, and the reason why I don't think there were any gaming REITs prior to ours was the highest and best use of all these properties is gaming. So the next best use for any of these properties is something that generates much less revenue and rent than what a gaming establishment would. So our concern was always that at the end of this 35 years, how do we ensure that if Penn or Pinnacle or Boyd or El Dorado or whoever it might be doesn't want to run these properties anymore, how do we ensure that we get somebody else in there that does want to run these properties rather than just having the license move across the street or, or next door or, or, or to a neighboring county? So we have a provision in our leases that at the end of the term, whenever that might be, um, if, if, assuming we don't renegotiate a new lease with our tenants and our tenants want out, how do we transition to the new tenant? And so that, that provision is structured so that if Penn at the end of the term decides they no longer want to be the tenant in our buildings, they're required under the lease to sell their operating assets to a new tenant that will enter into a new lease with us in that building to continue the gaming operations. And there are all sorts of nuances in those provisions to ensure that they get fair market value and that our lease is fair market. But the desire is to ensure at the end of that lease term, not that gaming stops or that you have to reissue a new license to a whole new establishment that's going to build a new casino and you're going to have two or three years or certainly more than a year where it's dark while somebody constructs something new, we have the same interest you do, which is essentially make sure that those properties never go dark. And so that provision has been put in place to let them out, let them get fair market value for their assets, but ensure that there's a new tenant in that building that obviously will be subject to the licensure of the various gaming agencies that will continue to operate in those facilities. So that's our goal long term is always to have a tenant in there. And that's why that provision is in the lease. Um, the only time we get involved in the operations of the tenant, and it's not even the operations, is we have some minimal capital investment requirements in the lease, which is pretty typical for REITs. 
ours are actually less than yours in, in your in your gaming regulations so it doesn't really implicate anything in mass you, yours are more stringent as are many others than what ours would be and we obviously have obligations in there that the tenant maintain the properties because as the tenant in our properties we want to make sure that the hvac systems are maintained that the roofs are maintained that the parking lots are kept maintained all, all the things that um are are affiliated with the ownership of the land and the building other than that we don't really get involved we have um, very few approval rights the only thing that that pen pinnacle and they're all the same our leases currently are all the same in this regard have to come to us is if they're if they're impacting the structural integrity of the building so if they want to tear down walls or they want to remove if they want to build on and they want to attach to the building we do have certain rights in the agreement to see those plans to ensure that our, they've, they've hired a certified architect that they meet all the local zoning requirements and, and the goal there is just these are our buildings and if while Penn is a triple net tenant and they have an obligation to indemnify us if things go wrong there if the building falls down and people are injured that's going to be on us too I mean yes we'd have an indemnification right but we're going to be front and center as the property owner in those and so we want to make sure that those buildings are properly maintained and if they do construction in those buildings that the integrity of those buildings is maintained so to date um, we've had many many instances where Penn has come to us with either a notice or an approval request same with pinnacle same with our friends at casino queen and we've to date we've never said no so, so there's nothing that's come across our desk that we've said wow this is a concern to us as a REIT so we're really not in it to determine whether or not it's profitable or whether or not it's something that we might like we're in it to make sure that the structural integrity and footprint of our building is something we understand and we know and we know has been done right and so the, the only other thing I'd like to point out um, and then happy to answer any questions you have about us is you know we view ourselves as a as a value add to gaming in these jurisdictions because as a REIT we are we are aligned not only in that we want the same thing you do we want a tenant in there that's running the facility that's operating it in a way that is maximizing the revenue for not only you but for us because obviously if you're not getting your tax revenues we're not getting our rent um, and we want to make sure that if they're not interested in operating that property anymore or they're doing so in a manner that's letting that property deteriorate that we step in and say hey that's not that's not what you've agreed to that's not good for us and, and I don't think it's good it's good for you and if they decide they no longer want to operate the property we are sitting there as well wanting somebody else in there to do it just just like you would and probably bringing forth people that we think might and for you to determine whether or not they can be licensed to do so um, we also and not a dispersion to the gaming companies but because of our structure from a financial perspective we're a higher rated credit risk because we are in GLPI specifically is currently split rated we're investment grade with S&P and we are a notch below in Moody's but because of the nature of a REIT where we distribute 90 percent of our net income and dividends to our to our investors we we don't incur a lot of debt we don't have a lot of operations so we are financially REITs generally financially are pretty strong creatures now that's not to say that there aren't periods in history where REITs got into trouble they have mortgage REITs had problems in the late 80s and early 90s you know I think there are some retail REITs that are struggling a little bit mostly with vacancies and, and lack of their rents are going down their tenants are disappearing that's a much different scenario than we have here and if that should happen to us I can't tell you we won't have a problem too if gaming suddenly is no longer wanted and these guys can't justify operating these facilities um, we'll have the same problem you will um, you know your tax revenues will go down our tenants won't be able to pay the same rents and we'll be struggling to figure out what we do next so I don't want to pretend like we're bulletproof we're not but I think we're very similarly aligned to, to, to you folks um, I think I'll stop there I mean there's there's so much we could talk about and do with respect to our interests and and what we do and what we try to do but I think that that'll come later I think those are the things that are probably germane to the issues in front of you today but that being said I'm happy to answer any questions you have about us thank you thank you my the oh, question that I have if my understanding this correctly that even if you were to redo not getting into the details of how but even if you restarted the clock the maximum time would be 35 years for at lease and, and renewal options for reasons unrelated to I think so I mean what you have to do because these are unitary portfolios so Penn, Penn Pinnacle whomever doesn't have the right to just get rid of one property 
so they're all tied together and they're cross collateralized and that allows us to pay a little bit more there's more security in that because of that you have to look at the useful life of all the properties in in the lease and you, we did a useful life analysis and determined that 35 years is about as far as we could push it under these facilities. Now, I know that's somewhat foolish in the sense that you say, well, gosh, there are buildings that have been around for hundreds of years. You could go around Boston and find buildings that have been here for well over 100 years. Unfortunately, the tax and accounting rules don't quite support that, even though we know people maintain their buildings, they improve their buildings, they do things to ensure that the structural integrity is maintained and they last who knows how long, right? Um, but we're stuck in that. And that really gets into accounting treatment as well. And without getting too deep into the weeds in an area where I don't belong, being accounting, um, the accounting rules are changing in 2019 so, such that things previously recognized as operating leases will have to be treated as capital leases in many circumstances. That doesn't apply to us at the REIT. And so the lease that we're purporting to put this into we, for, for the most part, and these leases somewhat are chopped up, and this gets pretty nuanced, but we believe that we'll have operating lease treatment for that, which is, which is optimal for us. If we were to put a 60-year term on a lease, clearly that's going to be treated more like a financing than it, is, than it is a true lease. And so from our perspective, it complicates it. We probably will have to carve that out into a separate lease, which I'm not going to tell you it can't be done. It certainly can. It's just much more complicated and not quite as secure as what we're proposing today. Thank you. Mr. Obano. If I may then, um, and I'm not going to repeat or read to you what was in the letter. I know you have that in front of you, but if I, if I could just briefly address the two points that are in front of you. The first is, a statutory interpretation question, do, after a transfer, does a licensee have to have, did the legislature say licensees must have a lease that extends 60 years beyond the term of the then license? And, and we looked at, first at the, we say the answer is no, you're not surprised to hear that, but um, we looked first at the transfer uh, provisions of the statute and the regulations. And, Certainly, the legislature contemplated that uh, licensees were permitted and authorized to transfer the real estate on which their facilities operate after a certain, um, after they were up and running. With the focus being on whether the new owner was suitable to be an owner and whether the, I think in the language of your regulation, whether the transfer it could be rejected if the transfer was disadvantageous to the Commonwealth. No provisions in the statutory provisions about uh, uh, transfers or in the regulations that say, and by the way, if you transfer the property, you have to have a new lease that goes out another 60 years. I think the reason for that, well, there are a couple of reasons for that on, under the, the statute. First of all, that requirement alone wouldn't, I would suggest, get the commission what it's interested in, which is the security of a long-term facility. You do get those, that security in the terms of the lease that you will have in front of you because the lease says to the tenant, you must, you must operate a gaming facility in order to be a tenant on our property. And as Mr. Moore explained, if for some reason at the end of the 32 years that re will remain on this lease, it was not renewed, the licensee would be required to enter into an auction process to deliver to the commission a successor tenant for your review. And, and upon approval, there would be a new uh, licensee in that pr property for a minimum of a 10-year lease and obviously the expectation here is that it wouldn't stop at 10 years. That's, that's just the starting point. So in terms of the security that's granted to the Commonwealth, we do say that's, that's present in this, um, in this situation. The reason the legal issue came up is because of section, perfectly reasonable question for um, the, the staff to ask, because section 15 of the statute, when it talks about 
an applicant before you even have your facility constructed? It says, so if you're an no applicant shall be eligible to receive a gaming license unless the applicant meets the following criteria, and then there's about, God, scores of them. But one of them is, own or acquire within 60 days after a license has been awarded the land where the gaming establishment is proposed to be constructed, provided that, and let me paraphrase from there, ownership of the land shall include a tenancy of 60 years or more from the license. So we say the, the way to read that statute is it's saying, okay, there's only dirt, there's no facility, someone's coming in, they're being considered for a license, and, and they either have to own it or we'll treat you as an owner if you have a 60-year lease. Um, makes perfect sense at the outset of the construction of a facility. But I, I would suggest it also makes perfect sense that when the legislature got around to talking about transfers of real estate, there was no need to include that sort of provision. Um, indeed, the licensee no longer will be the owner of the real estate if the commission approves this transaction, so the language of section 15 doesn't even apply. This special will treat you as an owner if you have, have this sort of super long, long lease. So that's why we say, and we're asking for um, approval of a transaction that has, a, starts out with a 32 year lease, I'd say substantial probability of 42 and, and reasonable likelihood at least of extending beyond. That's all I have to say about the lease term, unless there's any questions on that. Okay, that, that leaves me uh, with the, the trust instrument. Um, and as you know, the, um, the interim authorization regulations um, sensibly say that if we grant, if the commission grants interim authorization, and this closing occurs, subject to being undone if final authorization isn't granted, that um, if after initial interim authorization is granted, the commission determines that the transferee may not be suitable. There must be a trust provision that says, all right, at that point, you've, you've, the transaction is closed, but you need to transfer the land, in this case, to the trust, and then we'll see what happens down the road, if you are determined to be suitable, you may get the property back. If not, it may be auctioned. It could, many different outcomes could occur. Again, I, I think as Mr. Grossman said, all with a clear purpose of ensuring that if there is a suitability problem, that transferee is, there is clear separation from that transferee and in our situation, the real estate. So, we propose a trust that we believe adheres to both the letter and the spirit of, of the regulations and it, in this way. Here we know Plainridge has been the owner and I dare, think I can go so far as to say that's been a good thing. People like uh, Plainridge as, as the owner. We think you're gonna like GLPI as, as the new owner. But if there were to be a problem that arose in this transaction, the, the, we think first the most practical and beneficial result is ship the property back to the entity that owns it now and that is your licensee who you regulate and who you know rather than to a trust or, you know, God forbid, an auction and then what do we, you know, what do, we do at, at, at that point? So, so the proposal we have in the trust is that if there is a problem with interim authorization, um, then at uh, GLPI's option, it could either, the property either goes to the trust for the regulations or right back to the licensee. And the last thing I'd say about that is, I think that's basically the same thing as saying what we'd all agree on anyway, which is if you've got two parties in front of you, they want a transaction approved or an interim authorization approval before you, they could at any point say, thank you, but never mind. We're not going to do an interim authorization, but we'll file a new application and wait the full time to see if it's approved. That's effectively, I would say, all this uh, trust instrument is doing. And so for that reason, we've asked for approval of 
the trust provision as well. Questions? Um, can I ask, um, it sounded from your prior comments uh, from the group that um, as part of this transaction, the, 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 the property is going under the pinnacle master lease, um, mostly because of convenience, because that's the only master lease that you're opening as opposed to the pen master lease, which is where it originated from, because you're not opening that, that lease? Is yeah, that absolutely. Statement? That's exactly right. So we could have put it in the pen lease, but we thought since we were already making amendments to the pinnacle lease, it would just be easiest to put it in there. But is the pen lease the, uh, very different from the pinnacle lease? Or is no, it just they the are, legacy? they're very, very similar. The term is slightly different. The, the leases are almost identical, and, and the reason but is Hit the button for your. The, the leases are almost identical, primarily because we went through some FTC review, and the FTC has taken an in-depth look at our leases. We own five to six casinos in the St. Louis market. We have um, two casinos in, out of three in the Baton Rouge market. The terms of that lease were very, took a very long time to construct those leases. The Pinnacle lease only differs in that the initial term is 10 years as opposed to Penn's, which is 15. The total term of both is 35. The Penn lease has a percentage rent component. They both do a very small percentage rent component. The Penn lease resets every five years, Pinnacle every two years. So there's some nuanced economic terms that are a little bit different, but all the substantive terms of the lease are the same. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Um, Director, I mean, uh, Attorney Lilios, um, we know from the legal standpoint, we've been briefed that, that our staff is comfortable with this. Has there been some preliminary background checking and so forth, suitability checking by so IAB? So the IAB has been involved in all of the uh, discussions about these two preliminary issues uh, with you. Part of this interim authorization period is that we identify qualifiers for this transaction and that we get full applications, uh, the multi-jurisdictionals from the individuals, business entity disclosure forms from the uh, new entities. That process of uh, those submissions uh, have been uh, complete. Uh, we are uh, at the initial stages of starting that uh, initial uh, invest review. Uh, but from everything from the multiple uh, meetings we have had with these individuals, as well as some of the qualifiers were previously qualified before in connection with the initial licensure. Um, uh, to date, uh, there's uh, no uh, information uh, otherwise, but of course we have not completed the initial investigation yet. But obviously you're comfortable enough to be okay with the prelim preliminary decision. Uh, well, the decisions that you're making uh, today are um, uh, initial uh, legal decisions that the IEB is comfortable with in terms of, you know, the, any impact on the suitability uh, questions. Uh, and when we come to you the next time, uh, which I expect will be in August, that will be for interim authorization where we will have preliminary <laughs> recommendation regarding suitability. Got it. So we're only approving, you, you, you're asking, we're asking to consider the approval of the trust on those terms, and those were the lease term that Mr. Albano already talked about, and the provision that goes back if ultimately the transaction is not approved, back to the current licensee. Is that, is that a first statement? That's exactly right. It's just those two narrow issues. It's the, the terms of the lease as far as the uh, reversionary uh, ability of the beneficiary and the the actual length of the lease. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, the term, the reversion of the trust and the, the term of the lease. Right. Um, otherwise, everything else will be handled at the the next hearing. At the next time, we'll get to hear all this again. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm just curious because uh, I may not be able to remember to met, to to ask this question. What happens under the terms of the agreement to Plainville? Gaming and redevelopment after the they transfer the it's it's it is there it is the it is excuse me it is there it is the licensee it's the operator okay we'll it, continue to be the operator mm -hmm. under yep. Penn's control under okay. Penn Nationals control no change whatsoever that'll be at the next 
phase, that will be one of the considerations is whether there is any change of control or change at all to the gaming licensee, which is uh, Plainville Gaming and Redevelopment. Um, so you, you will get to look at that. I'll say, I'll say that. Good. All right. Anybody else? We have a motion. Uh, I'd be happy to move, Mr. Chairman, that uh, the Commission um, approve the request from um, uh, the licensees to include the trust terms as stipulated here. Um, we have to re redo that motion. I would uh, consider uh, moving that the you approve the trust as it was submitted in accordance submitted. with those terms and separately approve the length of the resulting lease that you'll be able to take a second look at. But at the moment, you're comfortable with the lease term. So Are we saying fact specific the length of their lease or just saying that the 60 years does not apply as a matter of law? That's, Either that's, way. Yes, that's more specifically. Would be the question of law whether the 60 years is applicable, not necessarily the 35 years being appropriate. That's exactly right. So I would say two separate motions. The first All is right. whether you I'll approve the trust. I'll, I'll, um, I'll strike my prior motion and make a motion to approve the terms of the trust as uh, submitted and discussed uh, here today. Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. And then we need to. I would suggest the second part is that you agree with the interpretation of Section 15, Paragraph 3 of Chapter 23K, that the 60-year language does not serve as a bar uh, in this instance. Okay. I'll move that uh, the Commission agree with the staff read and recommendation that uh, Section 15B that pertains to applicants um, not apply and, the, and, and specifically the 60-year provision relative to lease of the land does not apply to current licensees as, the, as discussed here today. Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Lunch? It's 105. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll do whichever. You want to Thank you, you very much. Thank, Thank you once again minutes. for the Taking time. Appreciate yeah. it very much. So we will adjourn for half an hour. We'll be back at 1.35. Thank you. Convening 2.45, I think, at uh, a little after 1.30. And we are on to item number five, Catherine Blue. Good afternoon, Commissioners. We're on item 5B. In your packet, you have a letter from MGM. They're requesting a waiver from one of the Commission's regulations. And this is regulation regard, the regulation regarding gaming schools. It's 205 CMR 13702, Section 2A12. And that regulation requires that as part of the gaming school curriculum for table games, that the uh, people involved in training to, to uh, learn table games be provided with or be required to take CPR training. <coughs> MGM has requested a waiver from that provision of our regulation. They've outlined the reasons for their waiver in the letter that's in the, in the packet. Um, they cite two predominant reasons, which is they have a highly trained security force um, who is more able to deal with these kinds of issues, and also because the uh, dealer at the table is there to protect assets as opposed to provide um, medical assistance. I know that we have come before you recently for waivers, and I just want to um, provide you with the standard for granting a waiver as you consider whether you'd like to grant this one. Um, our regulation 205 CMR 102.03 section 4 says that the commission may in its discretion grant or waive or grant a variance from any provision of a requirement contained in section 205 where the commission finds, and there's four things you have to consider, that granting the waiver or the variance is consistent with the purposes of chapter 23K. Granting the waiver or the variance will not interfere with the ability of the Commission to fulfill its duties. Granting the waiver or variance will not adversely affect the public interest. And not granting the waiver or the variance would cause a substantial hardship to the person requesting the waiver or the variance. 
So I think um, MGM has outlined its request and why it's making its request. I think there is certainly an argument that they've met the waiver standards, but there's also other, you know, arguments on the other side. And I wanted the commission to have an opportunity to discuss this and then uh, ask any questions that it has. Yeah. Well, how long is the CPR class in, uh, in hours in terms of? A couple hours. That's it? That's, yeah, approximately. Two, and that's anyway, the about two. We offer it here at our at our facility, and it's you know about two, maybe three hours. But they have to come to here from Springfield. To no, no, no. I mean, I'm, that's just I'm just sharing no. that we at the Gaming Commission <coughs> provide it to our employees. It takes up only a couple training. hours or, of time. No, this is provided at the gaming school. Okay. It's part of the curriculum. Yeah, I'm not persuaded at all that they shouldn't go because they should. Their training is their training, and they can't fit it into the curriculum. But I am persuaded. Uh, I am. Um, the, the fact that their primary job is to protect, uh, to, uh, protect the assets is, does make sense to me. You step away from that table and all of those chips are at risk and, and those things, uh, you know, so that piece of the argument uh, made some sense to me. I'm, I'm all in favor for everybody being CPR trained, frankly. I think it's, it's only good, but I do see the point that stepping away from the table and the fact that uh, Everyone else in a close proximity is trained. Is uh, is is something to consider here? I've, I don't know if council can ask can answer this question or not. But I, I'm, I'm not persuaded that a half day class is a substantial hardship. But to your point, that doesn't mean, you know, functionally having them step away to pro to respond to that is the best way to handle it. Mm -hmm. Is there a process? For them to alert security personnel. I mean, ideally, I'd like to see them CPR certified, but then they so they know who to flag. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner. I appreciate the opportunity, uh, and certainly you know, defer to uh, Attorney Blue as to providing you with some additional information. But if it's helpful, I'll try to answer the questions that you uh, have. It's my understanding, uh, first of all, that the the company does have a very specific uh, emergency response plan that covers obviously CPR, and that uh, Mr. Rucker, who was here earlier, obviously will oversee. Uh, that particular function. I can't answer specifically as to whether or not there's a particular protocol for alert, but you heard today other um, circumstances about the interaction between um, certainly wait staff and other uh, service aspects and security and the interaction with management as well. And I feel pretty comfortable saying that there, um, there uh, you know, certainly will be uh, a way of alerting uh, security in this what we view as a very controlled environment uh, in order to get a person uh, as much help as possible. The only other thing I want to add, just in connection with the petition, just to be clear, that this is a joint petition on behalf of the Institute and MGF. And uh, Commissioner O'Brien, you did indicate earlier, you know, uh, is it only a couple of hours? You're not convinced. If you look at the, at the criteria that they're required to teach, um, one issue on behalf of the institution uh, is that this requires a completely different set of expertise so it requires them to bring in a separate person, adding an additional resource. And I know we've been sensitive around keeping the costs controlled for this. So while I don't dispute it's only a couple of hours, it is a very different aspect uh, that requires a different level of expertise in order to provide this uh, at the Institute as well. So is the substantial hardship monetary argument because it would be passed on to the students or that MCCTI couldn't absorb the cost of hiring? I think they are required to absorb the cost right now. Certainly, I think it would be helpful considering all the, you know, the cost controls and the attempts to keep the tuition to this uh, at, a, at, a, at the most reasonable level as possible. And do we know an actual dollar amount and what it I don't have that. Them? Sure. Mm -hmm. the, um, in the letter, the second page, top paragraph, you know, kind of addresses uh, you know, the rationale for security because it's more than just the service. It is also, um, it is also a crowd control, um, the contact of paramedics and, um, um, you know, collecting the information from the victim, all of those things uh, which are, are better handled by security. I, yeah, I'm not concerned that there's not someone close by to handle the situation. I, it just, I agree that the training is, is good for everyone to have. Um, but the, you know, the part of this that did, was persuasive was they're protecting that. Stepping away and leaving all those chips unguarded is not, um, is not in anyone's best interest. Obviously, saving a life is. And um, you know, is, is, is 
there's someone right there to handle that function within seconds, I, I, I think that that piece of the request is okay. Yeah. But the requirement they're seeking waiver from is not that they be mandated as job description to perform CPR, but just that they don't have to get the certification, right? The training. Uh, the training. It's actually, it's a requirement for the curriculum yeah. that they actually be uh, trained. That's an element. If you look at the at the CMR, mm -hmm. it includes everything you have to do for. And again, this is this is limited to only um, uh, uh, table game dealers um, that they're required to go through. And they have, I think, there's uh, 12 different elements that they're trained in. And then one of them is uh, a CPR component. And we're just asking to take the CPR component out of the training. For a practical matter, this requirement, my understanding, it, again, applies to the institute, not to the company. So there's not a separate mandate that all table game dealers be CPR certified. Um, it's only if you've gone through the institute's training that that's part of the curriculum. And we're supporting that and providing the, uh, the uh, additional information to the commission um, in connection with that to say that this function will be clearly covered uh, by security, making that not necessary to be part of the curriculum. Yeah, I guess the point I was making is all, everything in page two in terms of who would execute is not impacted by whether or not these people get trained in CPR. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Uh, I believe that would be correct, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I don't know how this is a substantial hardship just by going through the, through the waiver request. Right. Um, I, I think I, I was also trying to think of the other one, other part of the waiver, which is the the public interest. Um, I actually think that um, somebody being at least able to spot a symptom mm -hmm. as quickly as possible, just having some awareness, uh, which was the sure. purpose in my view mm -hmm. when we first wrote those those uh, mm -hmm. those regulations, uh, just having had at least the notion that you know you need to call security as soon as you see these symptoms, or have have at least gone through some kind of training and awareness. I don't think anybody's talking about certifications, by the way. Um, it's just the notion of going through, through training would actually serve the public interest. Um, I don't know how these, so, so I have, in my mm -hmm. view, kind mm -hmm. of like two elements of the waiver that kind of work against it. I actually agree. I, I, I was also um, uh, with mixed feelings because of the protection uh, yes. uh, element, but but if, if we're just looking at the waiver, uh, I have a hard time um, actually getting past two elements of the waiver. So I'm in general reluctant to yeah. agree with that. And your point is very well taken that recognizing the symptom and be able to call security over instantly is, yeah. is, 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 a, is, a, is a factor here. It would be critical times. Yes, being, rather uh, than not knowing if you don't have the training and the person might struggle for you know, more time because more someone didn't recognize the issue. Yeah, I, um, you know, we've already, I think we've already had one class that has gone through that did have CPR as a component of their training. Um, you know, I, I, I guess I question, I hear the other arguments, you know, I, I think to Commissioner Zuniga's point, you know, having that awareness, that training awareness, mm -hmm. whether you actually leave the table to conduct the you know the actual CPR itself is is uh, is certainly a challenge if you're walking away from your table. Um, you know I feel a little reluctant to to maybe grant the exemption, but in the meantime maybe kind of revisit the regs. I mean the curriculum is all laid out in our regs. We adopted I think what Pennsylvania gave us. You know I'm I, I feel more willing to do that than to grant an exemption when we're not sure we can meet <coughs> the standards of the exemption. Um, I know that that might impinge on time when this is coming up in terms of the schedule for the next class or the class that's currently going through. Um, you know, but I think there's some valid points to be made of, if not full certification, some awareness of training of a customer who becomes in distress because I think that is part of well, serving the public. Well, if you attend for a half a day, you're technically certified they have so it's not a it's not any more onerous to, <coughs> so you're you're having the training and you have the hands-on technique and then you are technically certified it, it it seems if I'm understanding this right there is a policy at MGM 
that in the event of such uh, a, a problem, the security people are the ones who are yes. mandated to deal with it, yes. not the table games person, not the, not the uh, mm -hmm. table servers. The, the, so we're training for some people to do something that the, the, the company's rules tell them not to do, you know, or tell somebody else to do. The job is to get the super, is to get the uh, security person to come over and take care of that medical emergency. Number one and number two. If I understood the other point, one of you said it right. If you come up from Foxwoods and you don't need to be trained, um, you just go in and get accepted as a job. You don't have to go through this training. So you know how to deal already. If you already know how to deal, you don't need to go through the MCCI program. So we have sort of a weird thing here. We've hmm. we've put up a rule that applies to some dealers, a, a training requirement that applies to some dealers, but not to all dealers. So we ought to fix that one way or the other. If we think it's important, then we probably ought to require it of everybody on the one hand. And on the second hand, we're suggesting a role for these table, for, for the dealers that is not consistent with the protocols of their company, which well, is also well, a problem. But the rules weren't set up to be particularized to a licensee. Yeah. I mean, they were set up to look out for the interests of the people there, so. Yeah, yeah and I think the point But if we're gonna stick with that, then we ought to make them undo this rule. I mean, I'm just saying. Or right just now. make everyone get certified. <clears throat> well, no, but under this rule, the supervisor, under their policy 900, the supervisor, are, there is a detailed response of each security team member to a life-threatening blah, blah, blah. But it's not in conflict. That yeah. rule is not in conflict with our regs. Yeah. Actually, supplement, I would argue, our mm -hmm. regs, which was my point about just the awareness, which was the original intent yes. of right. training. Yes. Well, if that's a different, yeah, that seems thing. to be a different issue. If, if, if there's spending whatever amount of time was required in awareness, maybe ought to be part of policy 900, you know, that as part of this overall emergency response, having table dealers be trained to recognize the problem, that makes all kinds of sense to me. But as it stands, it seems like we have a variety of inconsistencies in this policy. I don't see the inconsistency in the policy. It's actually a policy of them. They're yeah. quoting a they're quoting a, a CMR because we're asking them to submit their plan. Right. That's right. that's mm -hmm. that's right. the that's the, the regulation. When they do, it seems pretty reasonable that they would have certain people trained and there's a protocol. Um, I I just simply see it independent from our requirement of of having this training. I think the 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 point you make is an interesting one relative to some disparity, but uh, that has to do with where we place these regulations in the training or in the certification of the Mass Career Casino Institute, right. Uh, right, but all which was our lever at the time. Right. Yeah. But if, if, if we believe, I'm really mixed on this, frankly. I, I, I don't know which way I would come down on this. I'm just trying to think it through logically. If we think it's important that dealers be trained in CPR, then we should make them all trained in CPR. And I, and I would argue that we already did when we promulgated the prior regulations of, of for the casino certification for the trade. What we are now considering is a waiver from that, and uh, which is why I'm focusing on does it meet the four elements on the waiver, mm -hmm. and I have a harder time getting past waiver n reason number three and number four. Right. Uh, because it's neither in the... Uh, uh, I don't think it's a substantial hardship um, to the to the person requesting it. Um, to the case and point, we already have a class that went through it, um, and I don't think that this would uh, adversely uh, affect the public interest. Quite the contrary, it actually enhances the public interest. I, do you think it's important? No, I sort of, I, do you think it's important enough that we ought to have everybody, all dealers, have this training? Yes, so we it's important, uh, which is where we put it mm -hmm. in uh, in the in when we certify, where we um, put the regulations for the training for the Mass Career Casino Institute. Uh, now, if there's that's others, only if you go through that, but that's only yes. if you go through. The, right, but right. Yes. but uh, they have to go through MGM specific training, right? <coughs> so, uh, but MGM specific training would be compatible with this protocol, which I imagine, from what it says, teaches table games people who see a problem to signal the security. 
according to what it sounds like their protocol. That's what they. That's what. That's what MGM would train to do. And 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 again, which is not in conflict with having gone through two hours of training to recognize the. You know, it doesn't mean that they will do it. They just have to go through the training. Yeah. The the issue really isn't whether the training is is valuable or not. The issue really is. We have a regulation that requires this as part of the table games curriculum. MGM and the MCCTI are asking for a waiver. They have to meet the standards. You have to be comfortable that they meet the standards to grant them a waiver. If, if you feel comfortable, you can grant it. If you don't, you don't have to. Uh, the separate issue of whether it should be part of the curriculum at all is a different conversation for the well, commission. Well, this was Commissioner Stebbins' was his point. point. Right. So maybe we should deal with this. If, if you take that literally, if really the only issue here is whether or not the request for a waiver meets the criteria we've laid out, and you really stick to the letter of that, then then your point becomes very significant. Maybe the better way to deal with this is for us to decide whether we really believe that all dealers should have CPR training or not, and if they should, amend our regs to say that, and if they should not, amend our regs to take it out. Well, our, our regs, so our regs only have this under the curriculum. So there is no broader place in our regs to require all dealers to have CPR training. There could be conversations around the internal controls that MGM submits as to who gets trained and who doesn't. That, that's a separate issue. We only have this requirement as a curriculum requirement, and that's what makes it a little bit tough, too. So either we are comfortable that we can let MCCTI take this out of their curriculum for this particular purpose, or we think that the, it doesn't meet the waiver standard and it stays in the curriculum, but at some point in the future, the commission can revisit what the curriculum is in, in general, not just this particular part of the curriculum, but the whole curriculum. I'm on the latter, latter part of that, uh, which is I you know, narrowly think that the, the waiver request at this point doesn't meet the standards that we set out for waivers, mm -hmm. uh, and that if we need to revisit this issue, come back and, 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 and think about it. Um, somebody have a motion? Let me see if I can articulate it better than the last time. Um, I will move that the Commission does not grant the waiver um, petition from uh, MGM and MCCTI relative to the training on, C on CPR measures as presented here uh, and discussed here today. Second. Further discussion? How many days is the, tr is the training? The training is a couple of hours. No, no, between the overall oh, training. The overall training? So I, the, I don't know. Jed, do you know? Uh, it's the number of hours is in the reg. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, it, it goes over a period of uh, weeks, I believe. Yeah, the total. training hours, if you look at section, I don't know if you have it, uh, 137.02 curriculum, it's broken down and it depends on the type of game you're being trained right. with, but the maximum is 200 hours to deal craps. So you're talking a pretty small percentage of yeah. the total. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Any further discussion? So the motion was what? Remind me. To deny the, the, the waiver, the, the waiver as okay. requested here today. All in favor of denying the waiver, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the denial is passed unanimously. <coughs> Thanks. <coughs> Items 5C through 5J are um, regulation requests that you have seen before. They were the subject of this morning's regulation hearing. So this, those regulations are in the final promulgation process. We have received no comments on any of these regulations. Um, so they are ready to move to the final stage and um, get finished up. The last two regulations are new, and so we can talk a little bit more about them. This will be the first time that you're seeing them, so we're asking you to begin the promulgation process. So I just thought it would be helpful to know kind of where we are with each one. Um, 5C, this we're asking you to approve the final draft version of 205 CMR 101. That's the adjudicatory proceedings, the, the new hearing regulations that we have gone over and have been in front of you a couple of times. Um, again, they were at the public hearing this morning. We've received no comments, and so we're asking your authorization to complete the promulgation process. 
So, Mr. Chair, I move that the Commission approve the amended small business impact statement for CMR for 205 CMR 101 adjudicatory proceedings included in the packet. Second. Further discussion? Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. I further move that the Commission approve the version of 205 CMR 101 adjudicatory proceedings as included in the packet and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to finalize uh, the regulation promulgation process. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Uh, 5D is the final draft version of 205 CMR 115 and then all of the other sections of our regulations that needed to be adjusted once we made changes to the adjudicatory proceedings in 101. So we're asking today for you to approve that final draft version and the amended small business impact statement so we can complete the promulgation process for those, that group of amendments. Mr. Chair, I move the Commission approve the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 115 at AL hearing procedure updates included in the packet. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. 5E <coughs> is the final draft version of 205 CMR 138.6. Yeah. Catherine, do you want me to, I guess, yeah. do yeah. Oh, part oh two. that's right, I forgot. I'm sorry. You jumped in. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I also move the Commission approve the version of 205 CMR uh, 115 at AL hearing procedure updates as included in the packet and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. <coughs> 5E is 205 CMR 138.62. This is payment of table game progressive payout wagers. This is an, uh, an amended regulation for the institution of table games. Um, and this was one we heard this morning as well in the rate hearing. We have a motion. So Mr. Chair, I move that the commission approve the amended small, small business impact statement for 205 CMR 138.62 payment of table game progressive payout wagers, supplemental wagers not paid from the table game inventory included in the packet. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. And I further move the Commission approve the version of 205 CMR 138.62 payment of table game progressive payout wagers supplemental wagers not paid from the table game inventory as included in the packet and authorize staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the regulation promulgatory process. Second. Second. Discussion? Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The yeah. ayes have it unanimously. 5F is the final amended version of 205 CMR 143.02 for progressive gaming devices. Do I have a motion? We do. All right. Uh, I move the commission approve the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 143.02, progressive gaming devices in the packet. Second. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Uh, I further move the commission approve the version 205 CMR 143.02, progressive gaming devices is included in the packet and all my staff take all steps necessary to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. 5G is the final draft version of 205 CMR 146.23. This is the physical characteristics of the chase the flush table. Second. No. Do we have a motion? I'll move that the Commission approve the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 146.23, chase the flush table, physical characteristics as included in the packet. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. I further move that the Commission approve the version of 205 CMR 146.23, chase the flush table physical characteristics as included in the packet and authorize staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Second. 
I further second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. 5H is the final draft version of 205 CMR 146.63. This is progressive wager equipment. Motion. Mr. Chair, I move the uh, commission approve the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 146.63 progressive wager equipment included in the packet. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. I further move that the Commission approve the version of 205 CMR 146.63 progressive wager equipment as included in the packet and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Section 5I is the final draft version of 205 CMR 146.59. This is the physical characteristics for the crisscross poker tables. So, Mr. Chair, I move that the Commission approve the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 146.59 crisscross poker tables, physical characteristics included in the packet. Second. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Further move that the Commission approve the version of 205 CMR 146.59 crisscross poker tables, physical characteristics and, as included in the packet, and authorize staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the regulation and promulgation process. Second. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. 5J is the final draft version of 205 CMR 146.58. This is the physical characteristics of the crazy four poker table. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move the commission approve the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 146.58 crazy four poker table, physical characteristics included in the packet. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Uh, I further move the commission approve the version of 205 CMR 146.58 crazy four poker table physical characteristics as included in the packet and authorize staff to take all necessary steps to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. 5K is an amendment to 205 CMR 135.01 and 205 CMR 139.04. This is the first time it's before the commission and I know Commissioner Stebbins may want to weigh in on this too. We have talked about this before, about addressing the definition of veteran. That definition shows up in 135. That's about the only place in our regs that shows up. And we, if you remember back when we started the process, we did veteran certifications, and then at some point OSD started to do veteran certifications. The change in this definition mostly syncs it up with what OSD does, but it takes care to make sure that we're not impacting any contracts that are currently held by um, veteran certified enterprises that have been certified under the prior conditions. So it's going to, this change will not impact existing contracts, but as we move into operations, it will provide for people being certified by OSD. And I think it stops us or our certification too, does it not? Or It, it kind of takes us out of the certification business for folks that were helping with construction. Mm -hmm. um, what we've encouraged folks to do is to get their VBE certification from OSD. Our meetings with OSD show it does not take a great deal of time to get them through that process. Um, and we actually actually allocated some funds to OSD to help them with that. Um, but it, again, we stepped in when there was a need to be filled. And now I think we're kind of stepping out of it and giving uh, agencies that do this as their course of business, the ability to do the actual review. Um, I personally, one of the things I was always worried about is because the nature of our review only asks for some background information, some of their discharge information, that um, we hate to ever have a, a situation where somebody says, hey, I'm a VBE, and they're not a VBE, and this kind of takes us again away from what our stopgap solution was and provides a more permanent solution and again also helps our licensees get credit for doing business with VBEs and uh, and maybe through 
uh, their interaction with SDO also opens them up or makes them more aware of other bidding opportunities that they could have with the state. So, mm -hmm. so what happens when if somebody just leaves a contract open-ended uh, and decides to continue just for the casino purposes? So if um, it's how do we know? How do we know that eventually some everybody's going to go via the OSD as as, mm -hmm. as intended here? Well, I think we think that most of the current contracts are for construction purposes, and we'll uh -huh. be moving out of construction. So mm -hmm. if, let's assume there was a company that could provide both construction and post-construction services. They would most likely have to enter into a new contract, and at that point, they'd be covered by these new rules for mm -hmm. post-construction. One of the things we were concerned about when we drafted it was that we did not want to impact Mm -hmm. current contracts that, and current construction projects that were trying to calculate how many VBEs they had on site. So this really will, will impact the operations portion, and once construction's done, it shouldn't be an issue. Is it clear that the criteria are essentially identical? So we won't have, a, we won't have approved somebody as a VBE who can't, VBE who can't get approved by OSD? Um, no. 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 Criteria, I, our criteria are pretty much the same. Yeah, the criteria was pretty much the same. You know, the, the two big, biggest pieces is demonstrate that you have discharge papers that show you're a veteran, and we added a page to our, um, to our licensing documents that allowed an individual to do that. Um, I think where... Uh, you know, SDO offers some value is that, you know, there's a big piece of minority women or veteran business enterprise designation comes through, does the person actually manage and run the company? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think they were able to do a much deeper dive on that than we were in a position to do. So I think, you know, this, this kind of helps us, um, again, moving away from something that, you know, we found a quick solution to <coughs> and putting it uh, so that everybody is uh, is on firm and solid ground for our licensees to say they do business with this number of VBEs as well for the VBE to be able to continue to pursue some opportunities. But it is likely to that point that um, with OSD rules, the businesses now have to provide more evidence of actual ownership and control, not just the papers of some individual who is associated with the, with the business. So there is some... There is there some is, possibility that is. somebody, but but it's too bad because the OSD is doing a better job than, than we would have In done. In a nutshell, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So do we need to move? Put, put this so, into, into yes, because we'll, yeah. we'll start this. We'll start the promulgation process. It will take comments. We'll have a public hearing down the road and bring it right. back to you for a final approval. Okay. Commissioner? Uh, just want to make sure I'm on the right spot. Yes, um, I move the commission approve the small small business impact statement for the amendments to 205 CMR 135.01 definitions and 205 CMR 139.04 reports and information to be filed with the commission is included in the packet. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Uh, I further move that the Commission approve the version of the amendments to 205 CMR 135.01 definitions and 205 CMR 139.04 reports and information to be filed with the Commission as included in the packet and authorize the staff to take all necess steps necessary to begin the regulation promulgation process. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. 5L, these are amendments to the reports and reconciliation um, on gross gaming revenue. And I, I think, what, as you've seen us come back to you before with changes on some of these reporting requirements, we are conforming the reg to what we've determined is really the best practice. So the reg as it was originally drafted talked about the gaming licensee sending us money and it, you know, it wasn't as clear on the true up. What you see now is what we actually do. We send them an invoice, we detail how we true it up. So we think it makes more sense. We're, back, we're enshrining what we think is the best practice for now. So that required a certain change and clarification to our regs. This is um, beginning the process, so we will take it through. We'll get comments. We'll go through the public hearing process and then bring it back for final approval. Um, is there a B 
missing from that second yes. red line should After be, the um, be refunded? That might be, yes. We'll yes. clean it up okay. before it goes out. So do we have a motion? Makes sense to me. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that the commission approve the small business impact statement for amendments 205 CMR 140.04 reports um, and reconciliation regarding gross gaming revenue tax and uh, as included in the packet. Second. Discussion? Uh, can I just ask, should we be writing this in the active voice instead of the passive? I mean, we're striking mean, out active voice you and mean the reg? passive. Um, yeah, for the reg language. Can we clean we that can, up after we this? Can, yeah, we can look okay. at that. Yep, definitely. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was That's a it. good one. <laughs> Um, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. And I further move the commission approve the version of amendments to 205 CMR 140.04 reports and reconciliation regarding gross gaming uh, revenue tax as included in the packet and authorize staff to take all steps necessary to begin the regulation promulgation process. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Thank you. That's all of the regulations for today. <laughs> Thank you. The last item on our agenda is commissioner updates. Anything? No. I have one. I just um, returned from a um, panel, <coughs> sitting on a panel in uh, Niagara Falls, a gaming conference uh, with our colleagues from Canada. And um, um, as we usually do, we did uh, receive accolades for our responsible gaming, in particular our Play My Way, um, Game Sense, as well as our research from a number of uh, Canadian regulators. Mm -hmm. And uh, in addition um, to that, um, our, our colleagues were most interested in uh, sports betting because they really feel like it'll affect uh, what they do there, they do not have the ability to um, to have in-game betting, so they were very very uh, interested in what we do. We'll do state by state, and um, as well as while we were in conference, um, their their Senate passed uh, cannabis uh, on a recreational basis for the entire country, and they gave it to the gaming regulators regulators to regulate. So there was um, much discussion about that, that they have a new industry to regulate. Um, and our colleagues, for, or rather our um, former uh, consultants from uh, Spectrum Gaming as well as HLT send their regards to uh, all the commissioners. And of course, um, you know, uh, talked, talked fondly about their, uh, their assistance to us in the past. So just wanted to pass that along. Great. Thank you. So is, is, don't the different provinces of Canada have different they jurisdictional each, structures? But they each have, um, they do, um, they regulate gaming by province, mm -hmm. right. but the federal government has now given them cannabis to regulate by province as well. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, I had the occasion on Monday to talk to the uh, Governor's Advisory Commission on Travel and Tourism, uh, which the group consists of pretty much all the regional tourism councils from around the Commonwealth. So it was, uh, it was a great way to update them on where we are with our licensees, what their impact is going to be, as well as um, the direction of some of the monies that come from the taxes on our class one licensees, some of that going towards tourism, some of that going, going towards the gaming economic development fund. Um, there, was, uh, there was a lot of general interest and in not from the host regional tourism councils, but from others to say, hey, how can we get, how can we find an opportunity to work with the licensees to get somebody to come explore, you know, fly fishing up in Franklin County or, you know, make sure they're aware of the 400th anniversary of Plymouth and, you know, making sure that visitors to all the facilities have a chance to, um, ex you know, get out and explore the date and may, uh, state and uh, maybe extend their visits. Um, so uh, Director Griffin and I talked about uh, it might be worthwhile for, uh, the appropriate folks that are licensees to have a chance to be in front of this group and think a little bit more statewide about how some of their guests and visitors might want to take in some other 
activities that are of interest to them. So, um, and some of the RTCs also wear a dual hat as a Chamber of Commerce, so we also talked about uh, the purchasing and supplying power that isn't geographically restricted because uh, MGM wants to buy seafood. The best place is probably not the Connecticut River, but Gloucester or New Bedford or out near the coast. So um, it was a good conversation and you know some good kind of follow-up to-do items uh, as a result. Great. Anybody else? Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The ayes have it unanimously. Thank you all.